<coughs> the Willie Plank Commission meeting for Thursday, October 23rd is called to order. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge, I pledge allegiance, allegiance to the flag of the United States, States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Mr. Secretary, would you please take the roll? Commissioner Dorband. I'm here. Commissioner Johnson, I am here. Commissioner Powers. Here. Commissioner Stylin. Here. Commissioner Vito. Here. Commissioner Zangara is absent with prior notice. Mm -hmm. And Chairman Rafato. Here. Mr. Jennings, any changes to the agenda? Uh, there are no changes this evening. Okay, good. Number five, citizen concerns and comments. At this time, anyone in the audience uh, can speak to <clears throat> any issue other than those on the items for review. Is there anyone here? Nope. No consent items tonight. <coughs> items for review. Docket number PC 14-16, Northfield Presbyterian Church, 380 West Palatine Road. Minor site plan and appearance approval for building modifications. Mr. Jennings. Thank you. Uh, Northfield Presbyterian was in front of you uh, approximately a year or so ago um, with a uh, special use to occupy the building located at Palatine Road. At the time, there was some question as to exactly how a vertical addition might be treated. Uh, the church requested consideration for some flexibility so that they could have a structural engineer get in there and take a look at the building. Uh, they are now back with a proposal for how they intend to uh, handle the exterior materials on that. And with that, I would pass it off to the petitioner. Just drop your brick wall. We know they're heavy. We know you're here. Pressing bricks for you. Great. Thank you. Show. Thank you so much uh, for uh, giving your time to uh, for the special permit usage. And, Could you uh, give your name and... Uh, my name is Gary, uh, Gary Jung, and I represent... Uh, Northfield Presbyterian uh, Church in Wheeling, and we are relocating because of the expansion and, you know, just to deliver that. And uh, I believe the, right now the current existing usage is the office building. Uh, the church has purchased this about a year ago, and uh, because of this uh, low ceiling, it needed some type of higher ceiling to make it more for the audio and visual effect for the church. So what we decided to do was raise another ten, uh, five to eight feet to make it about 20 feet ceiling interior uh, on the east side of the building. And you'll see that we, uh, we uh, over the past years, we've been looking at with the structural engineer and uh, we had a lot of different uh, thoughts about raising the building, but uh, I think in ultimately the most uh, economical way for doing this is just raising the bricks, matching the bricks and just raising it up. Uh, and basically it's gonna, uh, the existing brick is a uh, utility brick and we're gonna match that as best as our ability. And if not, uh, we, we got some matches, but you know, and in the front of the facade, uh, we're just going to put some stone, uh, basically a stone uh, facade, just to uh, make it more look like a church. And I brought some samples here. This is a stone sample. Brick, uh, utility brick that we're trying to match with the existing. And while we have this up, just two quick points of clarification on the drawing that we see in front of us. You have a horizontal line here. Uh, right. What is that constructed with? Well, that is the, the that's the existing line of okay. uh, the existing brick where it stops. We're okay. just going to put soldier bricks there and contrast that. Just, you know, just to give a historical perspective where the original buildings stand. Yeah. And then this feature, is that open air? Yes, it's, it's an open air. Okay. Thank you. Anything else? No, that will be it. Okay, great. We'll start with Commissioner Johnson. Thank you. Uh, Andrew, my first question is about the drawing that's up there right now. I, I believe that's actually the west elevation, not the east. 
in going through the other drawings. Yes, that's correct. Okay. Yes, that's correct. Um, I really didn't have a lot of questions on this. I think it, it looks pretty nice, and we kind of went through this before. I, um, I'll hold off on anything else at this point. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Darvin. I have nothing. Thank you. Commissioner Stalin. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I guess the only uh, comment that I have, uh, it appears in that uh, light-colored area on the, the front, you have a, a cross yes. that's kind of located on the bottom. Any chance in raising it up? Well, our intention was to bring the existing cross that we have. We have a stainless steel cross, uh, which we have in the existing, you know, our current location, we'd like to bring that over here. And it's kind of hard. I guess we could do it by you know, attaching it to the facade rather than anchoring, anchoring it to the building. But we like to anchor it <laughs> solidly on the... How front. about uh, lighting up that, that area? Are you yes. going to do any kind of lighting? Oh, yeah. no, to that, that's a possibility that we can light up. I think that would, uh, yeah, we would know, help accentuate We welcome that. that idea, and I think it's great. Thank you so much. Okay, that's my only concern, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Vito. Uh, I have no questions. Thank you. Commissioner Powers. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Um, you talked about the line the, that signifies where, where the new part's going to be. You said it was, a, what, a soldier brick or something? Yeah, soldier brick. What, what is a soldier brick? I, well, I don't know. Yes. When, when you... Usually, you know, it's a common brick and common bond, mm -hmm. you know, basically overlapping each other just to give it solidarity and a little more. I, I, but uh, the soldier brick is when you stand up the building. Okay. Yeah. And Sorry, I didn't, I didn't know. Um, and you also said at the, at the top where you're, so, so that stone that you showed us, that's going to be the, the, the different colored part where you're going to have the cross, correct? Right. Yes, yes. And then the... The two points that go up towards the top, you said it was open air. I mean, it's 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 not like glass and clothes where no, you'll no, see no, from no, the inside. No, no. It's, it's just, just open. Okay, so at the top, you're just gonna just bring it in towards the top, right? Okay, I have nothing further, and I have nothing. It's a nice design. Thank you. Nice addition. Um, now that Commissioner Stylin's idea about the the lighting, do we need that as a condition? Oh, well, we can add it uh, in case uh, we forget. Yes. Okay. Well, that's 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 great. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Especially you know, just, stainless steel, it'll be nice to accentuate that. Yes. Thank you. You know, we we should just say that if if they decide to do it, that it's okay. Yeah. That, yeah. You know, I don't want to mandate that they right. do it. <laughs> no, I think it's a great idea. We would like to pursue that. Okay. So, I dear, do I hear a motion? So moved, Mr. Chairman. Second. Motion by made made by Commissioner Stylin, second by Commissioner Dorban, Mr. Secretary. Commissioner Stylin? Yes. Commissioner Dorban? Yes. Commissioner Johnson is a yes. Commissioner Powers? Yes. Commissioner Vito? Yes. And Chairman Rafato? Yes. Thank you so much. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. You'll have something to sign.
Calling docket numbers 2014-15, PC 14-17, 14-18, 14-19, and 14-20. The Whitley 60 through 156 one West Dundee Road special use site plan approval of a preliminary planned unit development for an assisted living facility with memory care <coughs> approval of preliminary plat of survey for the Whitley <coughs> approval of preliminary plat of subdivision for Shir Hadash approval of a preliminary plat of consolidation for the Whitley approval of preliminary plat say that four times in a row of consolidation for Shir Hadash Mr. Secretary I'm glad you had to read that part Docket 2014-15, LaSalle Group contract purchaser is seeking the following for the property at 60 to 156 West Dundee Road, which is zoned MXT Transit Oriented Mixed Use District. Special use site plan approval of a preliminary planned unit development for an assisted living facility with memory care in the MXT Transit Oriented Mixed Use District. Standards for special use, the zoning special use is defined in Title 19 of the Village of Wheeling Zoning is a use of a parcel of land that requires review and consideration before approval due to circumstances or effects on the surrounding properties that may adversely affect them. In order to be considered for a special use, the petitioner is required to demonstrate through testimony to the Plan Commission at the public hearing why their request meets the conditions of the Village Code, including, but not limited to, how the proposed use will not damage the enjoyment or use of the surrounding properties. Prior to the public hearing, the petitioner provides written statements meant to show that their request for a special use meets the standards established in Title 19. The Commission Chairperson will typically direct that these statements be entered into the record without a full reading of them at the hearing. <clears throat> Based upon the testimony and supporting materials submitted, the Planning Commission will make findings in support of or against the petitioner's testimony and report those findings to the Village Board. Mr. Chair. Thank you. Mr. Jennings? Um, just a brief note uh, on, on where this project is procedurally. The petitioner was uh, recently in front of the Commission uh, about a month or so ago uh, for a concept review of the plan unit development. Uh, they took the direction of the Planning Commission at that time, uh, I've made some revisions to the plans, firmed up some of the items on, on the plans, and provided the additional layers of detail that are required for the formal PUD submittal. Uh, the village staff has reviewed this. You have comments, uh, I believe, in front of you from the uh, village engineer for the most recent edition. Um, I believe the petitioner has received those as well. Uh, our village engineer is unable to join us today, so uh, I will do my best to answer any questions that come up on that. Um, the, the process at this point um, is a combination of uh, the various land division and consolidation items, uh, as well as the uh, planning development itself. While this is being submitted as a preliminary planning development, as you note in the staff report, uh, the, the plans as submitted are uh, nearly consistent with what is considered to be the requirements of a final PUD. Um, as we get through the presentation tonight, uh, we, uh, we can discuss exactly how to proceed from this point. Uh, but with that, I'd like to go ahead and hand it over to the petitioner to go through the, uh, the presentation of the development. Great. Thank Mr. You. Mr. Chairman, before we start, yes. uh, as an employee of the synagogue and also a employee of its tenant, I will be abstaining from any discussion or voting on this. Thank you. Will you, sir, will you be the only one speaking tonight on this matter? Uh, no. I have an architect, an engineer, and a landscape architect. Okay. Could everyone that's going to be speaking please stand up? Would you raise your right hand, everyone? Do you swear the testimony you give tonight to be the truth? Yes. Great. Thank you. And as you come up, you don't have to do it right away, if you would give your name and business <coughs> address to our recording secretary, that would be great. And it's Stephen. Beecher, M-E-A-C-H-E-R. And what do you need an address? Sorry. It's the LaSalle Group. And it's 8273 Foxtail Loop. Pensacola, Florida. We should have that down here. We should do, we should do this down there. Here. The floor is yours, sir. All right. Um, 
Um, two things for us tonight. We'd like to go through uh, a description of the property just briefly, talk a little bit about uh, some items that had come up in the workshop, and then go on to uh, you know any of the formal requirements we might have to make for you. Um, for me, just a description of the property. Uh, we're seeking approval of a plan unit development it's called the Whitley. And um, in that, we'll be constructing and operating a 102-bed assisted living facility for frail elderly with 68 regular assisted beds and 34 memory care beds. Um, we believe in our submissions, the materials that we're forwarded for this application that we've met the standards for the special use and confirming that uh, we meet those tests as we go through it. Uh, the land is being assembled in two, from two owners and um, approval is going to be required of several plats to get us through the land transactions. They aren't quite as uh, awkward as they might seem and I'll come back to that, try to do them in a very brief form. But let me start by telling you about the company. The LaSalle Group is a successfully family-owned business that works only in assisted living. Uh, we do a lot of work in memory care. Uh, we develop, build, and own our own properties. Uh, the family retains ownership of all the properties. We have no intention of selling. Uh, in addition to having properties in Dallas, in Fort Worth, Houston, Austin, and San Antonio, we also have properties in Oklahoma, Atlanta, we have 10 properties here in Chicago, and we have uh, projects slated for places like Wisconsin, Washington, D.C., Missouri, and Florida. So we're not large, but we're not small. When it comes to this business, we seem to be well received by uh, both our peers and by our residents and their families. Um, You'll see from the representations that our civil engineers will make that the site that we're planning to develop has a lot of constraints. Uh, the property is basically across the street here. Um, it is roughly divided in half. Um, the north side of the property is all in a floodway, not just a flood zone. And the south end is uh, buildable. Um, we are going to be building just on that portion of the site, but we, I think we have some exciting news about what we're going to do with the uh, uh, rear of the site as well, although that won't be our property when all of this is done. It'll belong to Shiradash Synagogue. Um, as my people show you some of these details, you'll see that the limited building area of the site is a problem for us in terms of the normal kind of setbacks and room that you would like to have around your facility, uh, distances from roads, distances from other uses. Uh, we don't think that we're pressing the limit too much, but it's one of the reasons that we look to the PUD as a way to do this project. Um, we have a difficulty in having gone through this process and just about completed our civil engineering, we have not identified a way to feasibly put our stormwater management on site. Uh, the most uh, logical thing to do would be to put it underground. That cost is in the range of three hundred and fifty to four hundred thousand dollars, and it makes the project infeasible if we were required to do that. Um, the shape of the floodway that crosses the property also narrows as you go towards the east end of the property slightly. And that's going to pinch upon some setbacks that we'll talk about asking for some relief on. Um, the things that we're going to be asking of the city, the village, pardon me, will be um, to locate the compensate the compen uh, story <laughs> compens. Compensatory. I'll get it. <laughs> Compensatory stormwater storage off-site to charging into the village-owned facilities. We do this in lieu of asking for TIF funds. 
Uh, we don't expect to ask for anything else from the village. Um, we are going to ask for some code relief items. The village code does not specifically define what we do in assisted living. Um, we suggest using the state definition that we're licensed under. And it makes us really more similar to multifamily or a nursing home, but not actually exactly what either of them are. Um, this gets us into a little bit of a snarl with dealing with uh, parking requirements, for example. Um, we have standards developed in the industry, plus our own experience as a company that are in our application <coughs> materials that show that the parking that we've planned is one space per two beds in the assisted living facility. That's 62 solves. We are actually putting 97 stalls on the site plan, but this includes 32 spaces that incorporated into an easement for the permanent use of Shirdash uh, Synagogue for their congregation. Uh, this was something negotiated during our efforts to get site control of the property, and we've known of their desire to increase their membership. Um, as I mentioned, the, tie, the floodway helps uh, compress the site, pushes that to the front of the property, and we do have a situation where I'm going to ask for relief from 10 feet to 5 foot for the parking setback. We tried to offset for that by uh, putting in hedges, planting trees and things which will soften the look. I don't think it will be noticeable. But it's really a constraint that's uh, a function of that floodway that we can't build in. It will be important for me to show you a little bit about how these parcels are going to be uh, handled because it sounds confusing. It's much easier than it might sound. On the sketch that we have here, the SH lots one and two are actually Shurhadash's land and their synagogue is to the left. On OH lots one and two, this is properties owned by the Oshansky properties. We are buying all of the Oshansky property. We are buying SH lot one or the frontage from Shiradash. And we are going to sell OH lot two, the rear of the Oshansky property to the synagogue so that they will have room for a park-like setting and for other functions that they have in mind. It also helps us keep our property under five acres, which helps us with uh, some of our stormwater requirements. In the end, we will have a consolidated subdivision of SH Lot 1 and OH Lot 1 as our property, and we understand that Shiradash will have the synagogue and SH Lot 2 uh, combined with OH Lot 2. Trust that that's simple enough for what we're trying to do. Um, there are a couple of things that happen because of the way we're working with uh, Shiradash that I wanted you to hear about. Um, we have agreed to a cross access and entry drive easement and maintenance and shared parking agreement for the shared western driveway, which is presently Shiradash's driveway. That will give us a second means of ingress and egress into the property, but the primary entrance and egress is on the eastern side of our property. Um, we have uh, worked out agreements for Shiradas to use the 32 or 33 parking spots that we have uh, on the southwestern or I'm sorry the northwestern portion of our property that is behind our building uh, which we hope will help them in some of the things they're trying to do but it is also uh, in agreement for us to have a reciprocal use of their park-like area at the back of their property. We've agreed to commit funds for those improvements. 
Uh, they're described in the plans, but my architect will describe in a moment. And uh, we also have a right to use a portion of uh, the synagogue's parking if we have a special event, and of course with their permission. The idea here is that it's very seldom an occasion where we need much parking. But when we do, it's for an event. And it's usually in the evening, and we don't think it'll conflict with Sheridan. It was something that the fire marshal brought up as being a problem on other similar properties when they do have these kinds of events where the families come in. So the um, only thing that, that may still be outstanding in terms of conversation here is that we have, from the beginning, shown a proposed bike path across the property, both ours and Shiradash's. And it was dashed in with the idea that we have heard talks of a uh, bike path, but we keep finding sort of conflicting views about whether it's going to happen or not. So we're not proposing anything here, but we've generally located it. And we can talk about you know, what you all's pleasure is about that. Um, there have been a number of staff issues that have come up with this property. <clears throat> uh, none of them seem large. Uh, the, uh, there's an issue with crosswalks that were talked about in the write-up by staff, but I'll again have our architect uh, describe those to you. A bike rack for the front of Dundee Road where we had placed one in the back, we still don't know that any of our people are going to be hardy enough to bike ride, but that's one that's open and we can certainly proffer it. Um, we will increase the caliper of shade trees to three inches that we put into our plan and didn't realize we had a minimum. Um, there were some bollard light details or what appear to be bollard light details on the uh, bike path, the existing one, we had planned to put in bollards which were not lighted simply to prevent cars from expecting that to be a driveway because it's parallel with the entrance. Um, there, was a, there was a comment about wall mounted lights and you'll see that in our plans. We have a fixture now that works for that. This is no more than the front porch lights that you would have on any other building. Um, beyond that, um, I have an issue, I believe, with uh, comments from the fire marshal about the number of 911 calls we're likely to have. And I made a mistake. I got all of this data on a year's worth of our calls. I averaged those calls to about 27 in a year. But what I forgot to do in my math is that our properties are normally 52 to 56 beds, and this is 102. I should have multiplied that times two. It's not important for this meeting tonight. We'll be talking to the fire marshal and working that out with him. What's important for you all to understand is that we have uh, proffered to pay the, I'm going to call it the difference between what you are reimbursed for on these uh, ambulance calls versus what your cost is uh, for any surplus calls after we agreed to a number. Because I know that was something of a concern. It's a frail population. There may be a bunch of calls. Uh, we have pretty good data, but we're prepared to just back that up by saying we'll fix the number, and above that, we'll do the supplement. <clears throat> With that, what I'd like to do is ask my architect to take a look with you at the plans. They have evolved. Um, one of the things that they have evolved in is uh, the uh, comments that we received during a workshop on the project. And I don't know if you've seen that in your write-up. Uh, it's there. We've answered each of the things that we took down. Obviously, this is what we heard. and. Um, I'm prepared to go over those, or you might just refer to them in your package. 
Uh, Andrew, they're in there, are they not? Because it's part of the PUD plan. So with that, I'd like to have my architect take a minute with you, and I can come back and answer any questions. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, my name is Jim Moyer. I'm a partner with SAS Architects and Planners, 630 Dundee Road in Northbrook. We're just down the road. Uh, the majority of our business is the design of senior care buildings, and we've been working with uh, LaSalle Partners for probably the last eight years on all the autumn leaves projects in, in Illinois. We've done probably about 10 of them now. So we're working together on this project, and um, uh, so I'd like to just briefly go through uh, the design of the building. I'm going the wrong direction. Okay, so... Um, regarding the site plan, like uh, Steve said, we have a floodway that roughly goes through the middle of the, of the property. North of that, towards the creek, is really, we couldn't build any type of structure. We couldn't even change the grades on that, so we were dealing with just the southern portion of the building. So we tried to make the most use of the land as we could based on the program for the building and trying to be sensitive to the master plan and not having a large building along Dundee Road. So the site plan, we have two access drives. The one to the west is an existing access drive that we're gonna be increasing in width to, in to include a left turn lane. There's an existing synagogue sign that will be relocated to the west side of that drive. The east drive will be a new drive in the main entrance to the property adjacent to that marking or naming the building and identifying that as a monument sign and we've included a design of that monument sign that is using materials and the design is consistent with the design the architectural character of the building there's an access drive that uh, circles the building uh, we have parking along the south side there's roughly 33 spaces these spaces are for visitors and residents uh, there's parking on the northeast corner. There's about 31 spaces for employees. And then in the northwest corner, as Steve said, is shared parking with the synagogue, synagogue and overflow parking. The main entrance to the assisted living building is on the south side of the building in a, in a one-story uh, structure. There's an additional entrance to the memory support that's off the north side of the building with its own entrance and drop-off. Uh, the service to the building is located on the north side and the reason we located that on the south side is we are very careful when designing this building to, to bring all the exits and the services and the entrance to the building along the south side of the building in case we hope it doesn't happen but if the, the north side of the building flooded we could access everything from the south and not have to bring emergency vehicles around to the north side of the building. Uh, through floodwaters. Um, another reason for the service drive on the south is the north side of the building on the first floor is the memory support unit, which is a secured unit, and we didn't want to compromise the secured unit or the safety of the residents by having a cross access uh, service through that memory support. So, if we, uh, some other structures, there's a generator located at the east wing of the building, and then there's a maintenance building on the west portion of the building. Uh, going to the next slide, uh, the first floor. So on the south is the main entrance to the assisted living. You enter into a nice foyer uh, sitting area. There's some administrative offices at the entrance, and then to the left is the living room. Living room also includes a, a pre-function bar where residents can gather and socialize before dinner. There's a, a patio area for them to go out on nice days off of the living room. On the east side of the main corridor is the main dining room that also has a patio for residents to enjoy dinner outside. Uh, there's also a library, uh, another access into a secondary access and the memory support. And then there's the service areas near the service drive. We have the main kitchen, the staff lounge, electrical, water service, storage rooms, employee lounge. And then you have access to four elevators that take you up to the second and third floors. 
the north portion of the first floor is the memory support. There's roughly two identical neighborhoods, each at 15 units. This is a self-contained unit. They have their own living room, dining rooms. They have a salon. They have <clears throat> bathing. There's a greenhouse activity. So all of their needs are in, inside of a secured area. There are also two gardens, one for each neighborhood, that are secured gardens where the residents can go out on nice days and enjoy being outside. Um, so moving up to the second floor, the second floor is all assisted living apartments. They're primarily one bedroom units. There are some two bedroom and some studio, but primarily one bedrooms. There's 32 apartments on each floor. The only thing that differs between the second and third floor is the southern wing. And on the southern wing is a, a fitness area, a doctor's office, and some OTPT uh, space. And then the third floor is identical. The only thing that's different is the, uh, it, this is a multi-purpose space, the southern wing that residents can use for birthday parties, bingo, movie night, lectures. Um, the mechanical system for the building is located above the elevator core. Um, it's a, a variable refrigerant system, so it's all underneath the roof. Uh, there are two rooftop units that supply air to the corridors. Those will be screened by the roof that's on the building. And then additionally, there are some rooftop units for the, on this uh, one-story element for uh, providing air to the assisted living commons. And that is also screened by the roof that goes around the one-story building. So in terms of elevations, uh, one of the, we are very sensitive about the massing on this building. We didn't want to have a three-story building running parallel with Dundee Road. We wanted a building that had very limited three-story appearance close to the road and then receded back. And then we also um, put the one-story element in the front that really helps soften up the, the, the three-story structure. Um, in terms of architectural character, LaSalle Partners met with the village early on in the process and decided to really explore a, a prairie-style uh, character architecturally. So we've incorporated that into our design with um, very low hip roofs with long overhangs and a real emphasis on the horizontal lines of the prairie. So we have stone bands that emphasize the horizontals. Uh, some other elements of the Prairie School are large casement windows that uh, we've incorporated. <clears throat> and we've also broken up the mass of the facade with various bays that will provide a nice play of uh, shade and shadow along the facade. In terms of materials, another thing consistent with uh, Prairie style architecture is natural materials. So um, all the, all the built, the Building materials are earth tone, natural materials. Starting with the base is a natural stone that is a, a buff color with some browns and tans. Which would be this product. It's a, it's a natural stone, full bed depth. It's not a veneer. That's on the base of the building that uh, will come up to about the sill of the windows. The next major material is face brick. Um, the face brick is a red-orange color that complements the stone. A sample of that material, kind of a red-orange color. The next major material would be the asphalt shingles that give it a little bit of a residential character. The, the color is uh, an aged, like a wood, a natural aged cedar roof. which would be that material, and it's, it's got a little bit of a texture or a depth to it. It's not just a flat shingle. And I think that goes well with the brick and the stone. Uh, the windows will be casement vinyl windows, and we didn't want a, a bright white for a contrasting color. We want something more neutral tone, so we're using an almond color frame for the windows. Uh, we will also use this color for the aluminum storefront at the entrances and the fascia and the downspouts and the gutters and any service doors will all be painted this almond color. The horizontal access ba um, accent bands are a precast stone that's the color of a natural limestone color that blends well with the brick. 
And then in order to break up the facade and really emphasize some of the bays and not just have a monolithic brick uh, material, we have a hardy board siding material in an autumn tan color that's still these earth tone natural colors. Can we see the, uh, the precast? So this is going to be used where again? It's uh, the window sills and then if you see the horizontal band, Okay. Um, and then at the low roofs and the bay roofs, just to give the building a little bit of color and a little bit of life, uh, we're using a, a, a like a patinaed copper, light green color at the lower level roof standing seam metal. So we've included all of the elevations. Last time we just had a hand sketch of the Dundee Road elevation. The top one here is the Dundee Road elevation that's been drafted and rendered. This is the rear of the building, the north side. And then these are the ends of the building, the east and the west. So you're really seeing that facade and then the rest of it just kind of blends into the background. We've also included, at the, at the last meeting, we were asked to include uh, some of the utility areas. So the one to the left here is the trash enclosure. We've extended the roof, so we're shielding the view of the trash containers. And then we're fencing that with a uh, composite wood material that's pre-finished. And we've had a lot of success with this material. It holds up well, and a lot of our clients have really appreciated that it's really stood up over the years. The next. Uh, elevation is of the generator enclosure. Um, the corners will be a brick that matches the building. And then this, uh, the fencing will be a solid fencing in that same wood composite material. And it will be pre-finished to match the siding of the, of the building. The next elevation is the maintenance building. That will be one story. It's, it's got the same architectural character. character. It's got a hip roof. And the building material's got a stone base and a brick facade and some stone accents. So this is just an enlargement of those areas. Um, I guess I should also mention that along the service drive, we have a, an eight foot high wall that screens the service drive and that material will be stone. And the landscaping, uh, the landscape architect will, will come up and talk about it, but we're berming up against that wall about three feet, so about five feet of that wall will be exposed and that'll be the stone. So these are the materials. I think the only thing that's new here is we've included the lights that are shown on the elevation and this is a, an image of the light that we intend to use. It'll be mounted along the entrance facades it'll provide some light to the sidewalks that walk that are along that that'll be a dark bronze or an aged bronze color there's also a fence for the memory support garden uh, this will be a, a decorative dark bronze fence and we had to keep the pickets open and because we're going to be that's the only element that's really in the floodway so we couldn't have a solid fence for that Mr. Lawyer, before you yep. go on to that, can you go back one second? This, sure. The wall, is that also the same brick? Mm -hmm. And you're butting up to about three feet berm on it? Uh, no, that wall is going to be stone. That the that retaining screen wall, wall? That screen wall, yeah, it'll be a stone wall. Can you go back to the elevation just real quick? I'm not sure if that was... Yeah, so that's like right in this area over so that's here. That's the stone material that's used on the base of the building. That's correct. And then it'll be covered by about three feet of berm. Plus correct, the and then plus there'll be some evergreens planted on that. Thank you. So I brought along just a few uh, similar project examples. Uh, this first one, uh, we just had a grand opening. It's in Northbrook, Illinois. It's the North Shore place. Uh, very similar assisted living and the second floor is entirely all memory support. The ma materials are very similar to what we're pro proposing tonight. Uh, it's a natural stone base, a red orange brick, asphalt shingles. This happens to be a five story building. Uh, the next one is Brighton Gardens. We did several Brighton Gardens around the Chicagoland area. This is very similar in size and scale. The architecture is different but 
This is an assisted living building with a memory support on the first floor. Um, in terms of site lighting, uh, we just went with a very simple fixture. We didn't want to bring a uh, draw a lot of attention to the fixtures. We just wanted fixtures that would do its job and not provide a lot of glare to the apartment. So it's a dark bronze fixture, uh, 25 feet high, a shoe box that just brings light down and not out. So we have that located around all the drives. And then we have a similar fixture that's only 15 feet high, lighting up this existing pedestrian pathway. Another element that I didn't point out to you is we, have, we added a couple bollards to this to prevent people from driving, thinking this was a road. I think that was a comment last time. So we added those bollards at that location. So this is a photometric study of uh, what the light will produce. And I think that's it for the architectural design. I'll ask uh, Nick Matera to step up and talk a little bit about the landscaping. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Nick Patera. I'm a landscape architect at Tesco Associates. We're located in Evanston, Illinois. Uh, it's a pleasure to be, be before you this evening. And uh, what we've really come up with on this is very much a, a specific landscape plan to marry together with the uh, specifics of what Jim has just explained with the, with the architecture uh, to give the building and the landscape a, a cohesive uh, statement and image and together with the Shir Hadash uh, property to the north this will really look like a composed and uh, comprehensive approach to the to the site and to the landscape. Uh, some of the things that I would, I would uh, start to say that are features uh, and elements of this are really taking a tour looking at the property from Dundee Road and, and uh, approaching it from uh, the south elevation one of the comments that we had from a uh, workshop was the uh, shrub type planting that we have in front of the parking lot. Uh, this is a, a, a double row of uh, shrub planting that's uh, parallel to uh, the sidewalk on Dundee Road, but the intent is to make sure that we do end up having screening from the uh, parked vehicles. Uh, so I have uh, shrubs that will get up to a height of about a four or five feet so that they're obscuring front bumpers, headlights, uh, windshields, and such. Uh, but we do keep an open uh, center so that you really can identify where the front door is. And so it breaks itself up once we finish with parking in that center median, uh, right where the word Dundee is, is a, uh, a water element. Uh, it's a, a small uh, uh, a fountain element. The purplish uh, color around there and also at the front uh, door would be seasonal plantings. That's somewhat of a signature uh, that uh, LaSalle Group uh, uh, incorporates so that when people are approaching the building, uh, we're, we're looking at trying to make some uh, seasonal enhancements like you see at this time of year. If it's mums, if it's in the summertime, it might be some other uh, flowering uh, seasonal plants. Uh, that happen at those front entries. We also have shrub plantings, uh, tree plantings uh, that happen. Some of the other things that we've incorporated in uh, are the two end cap wings. Uh, if, if I have the two end wings and I'm entering in off of Dundee Road, uh, the three trees that you see on the east wing tip are evergreen trees. Um, Thank you, Andrew. And then uh, similarly on the west, uh, we've, we've kind of bookended it so that we don't end up having a kind of a blunt end of the building, but that there is a foreground of planting and then the building uh, rises vertically uh, from that point. Uh, in, uh, in and around the building, some of the other comments that came from workshop had to do with uh, what are we doing on the actual development pad itself. Uh, surrounding the building at the building's foundation, the darker green color is a, a shrub, uh, extensive shrub, and it's a it's a fairly lively uh, landscape that goes around this building. The uh, uh, the landscape would end up having not just evergreen and shade trees to give it some scale and presence, and we've really located those trees, the bigger ones, out toward the perimeter, so that the parking lot, uh, the end caps that I talked about, will have some presence with larger scale deciduous shade trees, things like lindens, honey locusts, uh, uh, at the circle where I had the fountain, there will be uh, pear trees uh, flowering a little bit more formal. 
uh, at that location. Um, and then as we approach the building and getting closer to the foundation and some of the articulations that uh, Jim had just finished talking about, the way the building has some bays and recesses, bays and recesses, those are more upright uh, ornamental trees. This might be flowering trees uh, that we can start to get some seasonal presence and, uh, and, and have some, some change from spring to summer to fall. Uh, but the scale of those trees is slightly smaller. So we really do have a, uh, a, a probably three or four rows of planting before from Dundee Road before you get to the building um, <coughs> with different scale and different patterns of planting. So we've really made the most out of what uh, Steve Meacher was talking about, the, the presence along uh, Dundee Road in looking at trying to get the landscape to uh, uh, present itself in layers. Uh, and so it's not just a static front. The way the building has a bend and a bow to it uh, and a complementary landscape, I think we really have come up with something here that's, that's very specific to this building and, and specific to Wheeling. And yes, it's right across the street, so it, it, we need to make it look nice. Some of the other comments that came uh, were a little bit more housekeeping type things. Uh, the two patios that are on the south side of the building will end up having shade trees, uh, uh, s such things as honey locust. We also have some uh, birch uh, trees, uh, white spire birch, as, as um, um, something that looks like it's a little bit less uh, informal and it branches up low, uh, but to provide shade in the summer. Uh, the, the idea of, of being able to look out and sit on the terraces on the south side uh, and, and watch. Uh, uh, sometimes there's traffic on Dundee Road, uh, <laughs> but watch watch uh, you know things going by for, as the residents want to sit and have have a lunch or a, or a tea or something on the terrace. Uh, they have the ability to look out and have some ground level planting, shrub type foundation planting as well as overhead uh, type planting uh, that can provide shade and a little bit of enclosure um, so that they can look out uh, but also feel like they've got a little bit of cover and um, um, a sense of scale. The, uh, uh, the building itself is wrapped by a foundation uh, shrub type planting very much like you would see in a residential building uh, we, and uh, the lighter uh, bright green color is a sod uh, lawn uh, that extends itself out to the to the parking lot areas. One of the other areas of concern uh, was the loading uh, area and the trash area where Andrew had asked about the eight foot wall. The uh, shrub planting, and these are upright evergreen uh, shrubs, would actually be shown on the next sheet. Um, so we could, thank you, switch over. And so what you're seeing there with the uh, staggered effect, that kind of triangular patterning as evergreen tree and these are, uh, we've been using an upright juniper, uh, much like what you would see as an arborvita, uh, but it's a little bit more uh, uh, durable as a, uh, uh, culturally we've got salt, uh, we've got sun. Uh, this, is, this is a good south exposure here, but we're looking for upright evergreens, uh, but patterning them in a, in, a, in a little bit more of an informal pattern up against that wall again, so that really you're not seeing the loading and the service area, uh, not only from Dundee Road or from the parking and circulation, but also uh, from the terrace. Uh, and so that the idea is to, uh, even if, if you're sitting on the terrace or on foot, uh, you might hear uh, a, a pickup or a drop off, but you're really not seeing it by virtue of mounding landscape walls and fencing uh, and, and such. Um, the the um, other comments that came from workshop, Andrew, if you could go back one, please. Um, we we have incorporated um, uh, benches at the front uh, circle uh, where the, I, I have you hopping back and forth, I'm sorry, but that was one of the comments that we looked to have some, right, little formal kind of a plaza effect at that location. Uh, behind the benches, we'll have upright shrub type planting so you don't feel like you're back is exposed to the east or westbound traffic, but just something to look like it's a little bit more inviting and to break the, uh, the hedgerows that I have uh, west and east of here, uh, the benches and the, and the water feature and the planting really start to uh, feature the, and, and act as a cue to say, here's where the front of this building is. Uh, the, 
the generator uh, back at the northeast corner is screened with upright, uh, so not only a fence around that generator, but we also have upright uh, shrub planting around that generator, so it really kind of uh, fades into the into the landscape. Um, the the uh, small maintenance building has again shrub type uh, foundation planting around it. There is a uh, bike rack uh, that has been uh, uh, proposed and shown um, on the uh, north side of the building at the, uh, thank you, perfect, right there. Um, so that if you are uh, able and interested, we have bike trails, we have bike rack. Uh, uh, that was a, a nice uh, uh, addition and comment that came out of the workshop as well. Um, there, there finally was a, uh, a comment about snow storage. Uh, one of the things that very practically is that we've, we've really uh, put a lot of effort into the front landscape in the, in the parking lot, the front of the building, the, the, the Dundee Road frontage, and uh, the snow storage would not uh, uh, be as uh, supportive in the front, but we, we are basically pushing everything to the east uh, where the existing uh, uh, trees are and then to the north. And so that happens to be the low area. This is where you want to pile snow. Uh, this is where it would melt and then eventually uh, work its way across the landscape as melt and, and to the creek. So we're really not anticipating stacking snow on the front of the building from not just an appearance, but from really from practicality uh, point of view. Uh, in, in final um, Form the the garden on the far north side that has been designed and coordinated. We've had uh, several meetings with Shirhadash, and um, some of the features of that are the open lawn in that uh, on the uh, west side. There's kind of an egg-shaped uh, walkway. That's a crushed granite, uh, red uh, crushed granite walkway uh, type trail, uh, an intentional open lawn uh, for for program or activity or just for uh, some some relief and open space. The other uh, more beige uh, yellow areas are, are showing as, as native uh, type, low profile prairie type uh, plantings. They're big enough uh, areas that we're not just doing it as a gesture, but this will have some, some presence as a, a, a larger scale. And this will be a, a place where uh, birds, wildlife, and, and we're not mowing uh, in these areas on purpose so that we do have another uh, dimension of diversity with the type of landscape. Uh, the, the nine uh, red uh, cherry trees are, are very much an orchard uh, with the idea that there could be uh, production fruit uh, if it's an apple orchard or, or, or such. Uh, and then the, the counterpart with the nine squares are a, a garden uh, plots that could be uh, 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 owned and managed by uh, Shir Hadash uh, for for growing uh, production uh, type gardening. So uh, these are these are some of the elements, and you can see the gray bike uh, village bike trail that runs, and it stays pretty quiet uh, along the creek. Uh, most of the existing trees uh, that are kind of that cloud shape over on the east side, um, they're they're there, they're remaining uh, intact. Uh, that's that's a pretty wild uh, bunch of trees. It's it's box elder and uh, uh, silver maples, things that have grown up over time. But they're, they're there, and they and they pres they do provide some scale and some presence. Um, and uh, to try and route the bike, it, in the eventuality that a bike trail was to go through there, you would be looking to try and find a way to work through these uh, existing trees and some degree of cleaning up uh, if we have dead standing trees or uh, leaning trees, uh, uh, those would be cleaned up and, and begin kind of the, the transition from managed landscape around the building to more of a passive uh, natural landscape as it gets toward the creek. So in, in all, uh, I think we have uh, really addressed a number of the comments from the workshop, but we've also come up with a specific plan <coughs> for wheeling, uh, a specific plan for this building. So if there's questions, I'm happy to answer. Is there anybody going to speak on something else before we uh, turn it over to the commission? Good evening. My name is Tom McCabe. I'm a civil engineer with Spaceco Incorporated. We're in Rosemont, Illinois. Just a couple really quick points. The site 
everything outside the floodway, we don't have any problem with it, just a <laughs> pretty simple. The floodway is, is our constraint. A couple issues, the fence and the floodway. Actually, <coughs> the floodway on the western probably half is actually the grade there is above the base flood elevation. So when we talk about flooding, there's really no flooding that's going to be there. The fence actually, the bottom of the fence will be above the base flood elevation. So the opening under the fence is also above the base flood elevation. If you know between floodway and floodplain, floodway, you have to prove through hundreds of thousands of dollars to FEMA that they're wrong. So nobody does it, <clears throat> we just live with it. But if you think of the floodway here, it's not, we don't have a flat piece of land and all of a sudden the flood when we drop two or three feet. When you look at it, it, it all looks the same. So um, we've got the, you're allowed, the allowable things in the floodway, you can put the, the parking lots in there as long as they're less than a foot uh, deep of ponding. So when Jim was talking about flooding the back, the back's really not going to flood, the building's not going to flood, the building's two feet, the entire building's two feet above the base flood elevation. So, and the parking lot to the west side is above the base flood elevation too. So it's just, just a map thing, but in, in actuality, this back parking lot will function as a normal parking lot. The very northeast corner may get a little bit, could get up to a foot and maybe the last four or five parking stalls. So that's really it. We don't have, <clears throat> again, this isn't, this isn't a cliff we're falling off into and the water's gonna come racing around that corner even in a, in a hundred year flood. Um, the, the access points, we've talked to IDOT about it. Since this is not an SRA, they said we can have the two access points. That's not a problem. They can both be full access. So we don't have to worry about right in, right out, or, or being lim limited down to one. Uh, SRA and, is? Strategic regional route arterial. arterial or? Regional arterial. Regional arterial. So there were, that's where they limit, they limit the access sure. points yep. here. We don't have that problem. So um, basically, that's it on our end. We've got part of the property. We are, as Steve had mentioned, we've got flood plain that we can fill we have to provide compensatory storage for. So that's what we're asking for to provide in your regional facility across the street. As far as detention goes, stormwater detention is not required on properties under five acres. So we're not looking for any waiver on that. We're under five acres. Uh, we're not asking for any relief on that or to use that volume across the street either. So our basic request is for the compensatory storage for filling the floodplain in the front. Okay. Great. That's really about it. This is a public hearing. If anybody wishes to come up and speak on this matter, please come forward now. Okay, we'll return it over to the commission. But first, uh, Ms. Antor, any comments? Uh, I know you have your uh, report in here, but anything additional? Uh, nothing additional to the report that was presented. I'm sure the commission members will have some questions for you. You know, we always do. So, Okay, I'm going to start with Commissioner Dorban. Oh, thank you. Um, I guess I'll go through these one at a time. Um, one of the questions that came up here, it says that uh, we need to confirm whether the decorative paver strips in front of the drive are intended to be functional as crosswalks, and if so, whether the eastern crosswalk will need uh, a walkway adjacent to the entrance. So the only crosswalk that we really have identified is along the west portion there and we're painting white stripes along there. That's the existing path. We don't have an east cross path in this uh, area. Is that where the comment was about? Did I misunderstand that? Sure. The, yeah, the, the question that I had uh, in the staff report referred to both sides of it, whether these pavers were intended to be doing double duty as a marking a crosswalk. Uh, this area, if you were to approach the site from the east on foot, um, you would walk, uh, I, I would imagine, into the driveway. 
Uh, we're actually looking if you're walking along you would come into this area here with the bench and the fountain and then right into the main entrance was our what we we're looking at and we would typically use that paving pattern as something to signify the traffic to slow down and this is across so they're kind of doing double duty they're saying this is the, the entrance to the building and then also kind of cautioning that there's some access here and this one was a little bit away from that, so we we just included the stripes for that crossing portion. Uh, the next item was um, confirming about the site lighting. Um, the uh, Andrew, do you want to talk about the ballard lighting? Sure. There was a the, the question from the staff report uh, related to the concept meeting. Uh, the the dots here. Um, I believe at the time of the um, concept discussion, there was a question as to whether or not uh, it would be um, uh, lit in this area. Uh, it's fairly dark in between the trees. Uh, the dots, didn't, they ended up on the plan. Uh, there was not a note regarding whether or not those were actually proposed as lights. I think early on we were looking at ways to light that, but we also have concerns with that being in a floodway and what would happen if that area did get flooded, how that the electricity and those lights would, seems to be kind of a conflicting. Um, shocking experience. <laughs> yeah, shocking experience. So uh, right now they're not proposed to be uh, light fixtures there. And, and the next one goes down to sidewalks and uh, Obviously, in our staff report, there's some issues with that as well. well. I need the staff report for that one. What was the specific language? Pardon me? What was the specific question? Well, it was the, the sidewalk, and you wanted confirmation on um, that the commission may wish to confirm whether the decorative paver step strips in the front of the drive are intended to function as crosswalk. Oh, so related to that was if this if this was intended to be a crosswalk, I had the question if, if um, this was a crosswalk, should there be a uh, pavement connection to it? Yeah, I think we're trying to maybe not use that area as a crosswalk just because the service trucks were coming in through there. We'd really rather have people walk down and enter through the center right here where there, we have the garden and right into the entry. Uh, and then I'd like to go to the irrigation. Uh, it appears that the, uh, the dotted line all the way around this section is going to be irrigated. Um, did you not intend to irrigate like back a little further? I mean, what was the intention of why, why you're not doing it further back? The question was uh, the extent of the landscape irrigation and that what we're uh, proposing is within the dashed line irrigation, um, the the plantings that are on the north side and the east side of the circulation drive are really not, uh, they will be watered and, and they will be stabilized, but that's more of a native type plantings, even with my shade trees. Once they're uh, past their, their guarantee, uh, they would stabilize and be able to, to grow just like the other trees that are out here. I don't have detailed plantings uh, here that need to irrigation in order to survive. Okay. Um. What part of the site were we talking about? Could I, could I, could you show me, Andrew? Where, where we're talking there's a, about? There's a heavy dash line that goes around right. the building. Right, I see that, but what, what point, where, where was the point where we had a concern about something not, or the question about what trees were we talking about? There's, there are plantings that are, that are being proposed north of the parking lot and in the Shir Hadash, uh, you know, the entire Shir Hadash area. Okay. Uh, these would be shade trees. Uh, there would be some evergreen trees. Uh, the the uh, tree that we're calling the orchard tree. Uh, there is a provision for water, water supply out there. Uh, that was a uh, coordinated nation comment that we had with Shir Hadash uh, for the gardens. Uh, they need water, uh, and there would be water supplied to it, but it wouldn't be regular uh, automatic underground uh, remote control irrigation system needed in order for that area to, to survive. So I don't know where this question was. That Andrew, was that your question? Where that came up? No, that was not. 
Um, in the uh, fire department's report, they talk about a fire pit. Yeah, I, I'm confused. Am Sorry. I missing this on, on the no, drawing? You're not. Did I no, understand? you're on it. Um, uh, thank you, Andrew. If you can see where the cursor is, but in the uh, at the end of that oval area would be a. Where, wait, wait, help me out. Where is Sorry. it, Andrew? Oh, right there. It's okay, a, I, I a, totally missed it on the. It's a, drawing. It's a Even flush. I kept blowing it up and I kept missing it. Okay, that I just, like I said, I missed it. Um, there was another question I had from the back. Oh, here it is. Um, uh, in, the, in one of the reports, it talks about walking paths with paved stone. And I, I'm just a little confused because if it's a paved stone, how does somebody with a wheel walker or a wheelchair right. or something get around on paved stone if it's uh, not? There are, uh, around the building itself, it's all uh, a concrete walkway, other than the, the pavers that you asked about, OK? Paved stone is kind of an awkward statement. Uh, there would be crushed granite trails or walking pathways within the Shir Hadash area. Um, those, that has to be in order to have, uh, be a uh, compliant surface for people who have uh, accessibility uh, concerns. That has to be what they refer to as a firm, stable surface. Uh, so that it has to be a compacted and, and not slippery uh, surface. So that, you know, if someone chooses, they don't have to go out onto the walking trails uh, that are in and around the Shir Hadash property, but they, they can choose to do that. But that, that may have been where that comment came from about a stone uh, paving. Uh, it's, a, it's a compacted, uh, like you'd see in a park, uh, 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 decomposed granite that it really locks together uh, and becomes a, you know, a hard surface. Uh, and I, I don't know who to answer this question of as far as the roofing material. Um, but Jim who wants to answer that question. Um, <coughs> what kind of roofing, what, can we see that again? Sure. And is it, it's fiberglass? Yes, it's an is asphalt it fiberglass mixture. It, it's not organic, I assume? It's a mixture of fiberglass and uh, asphalt. But it's not a It's not wood. It? No, it's an asphalt fiberglass shingle. So oh, it's a fiberglass, not organic. I mean, because I know the difference between the two, so I just want to make yeah, sure. Yeah, it's a, it's a fiberglass shingle. And, and who makes this? Uh, there are several companies that make the, this happens to be Timberline. Okay. Roofing. And is it, uh, are these architectural shingles? Is that? Yes, you yes, you okay. can, they have like a laminated, okay. they're a heavy shingle and they have a little bit of a texture, it's just not a flat surface. I just went through a few project in yeah. my complex, so I I know a little bit to be dangerous, but I, <laughs> enough to know, ask enough questions. Right. Okay, that's my only question, thank you. That was because there was something, an issue about organic shingles just recently, wasn't yes. there? Yes, organic shingles, you know, because they're, they're basically right. wood-based, mm -hmm. right? Am I explaining that right? And it's fiberglass is better than the organic because it's, it, they're just not, they absorb. Okay, interesting. Thank you. That's all I have. Thank you. Commissioner Powers. Thank you. Um, it, Andrew, on page 27 of the packet, um, it, it talks about me mechanical. And I, what I was wondering is, um, I know at one point, um, I guess I just want to ask in general, is there going to be any kind of mechanical equipment on top of the building located on the roof where that's going to need to be screened. I didn't see any indi indication of that. This there there are some one. mechanical units up on the tall, tall roof here. There's a, a rooftop unit here and a rooftop unit here. Those units are about five feet tall, but the, the roof slopes up and then stops and then there's a flat roof. So there's comes up and then it goes down so there's a wall that's probably about eight feet tall that screens that okay so you, you wouldn't be able to see that like from this at a street level right no you would not 
Okay. And then there are a couple rooftop units on this first floor, and it's the same story. We have a sloped roof that comes up about five feet, and those units are about five feet, so you would screen that. You wouldn't, it wouldn't be visible. Okay. I, I think the last time we met, too, we also, there were, I think we're, there was concern brought up about where the utility meters are going to be located. Like, are they going to... We didn't, I don't think we wanted to see them out towards Dundee Road, but we were talking about, I kind of was wondering where they would be and if they would be screened at all. So all of the utility connections to the building are going to be in this service area. If there's anything exposed in the landscape. There's really nothing exposed. Everything, the water service and the gas and the electrical service are all coming into this area that's screened behind this eight foot wall. Okay, so there won't, each unit won't have its, uh, an individual meter, or just be, you guys will just figure out it's all handled inside, nope. and correct. so we won't be seeing anything on the outside, correct? Nope. nope. Oh, okay. Um, in the, just so I know, I, I, I may, it could be in the um, plan. Um, in the packet, it mentions something about three lighted flagpoles. Where on the site is that going to be located? Is that a feature? I mean, it was, it was in our documentation. It said something about three lighted flagpoles um, fortunately this is a preliminary meeting because uh, although we have used flagpoles on all of our properties um, it has not been decided at this point uh, we have got to get our people together come up with something that looks reasonable and bring it back to you so it's your intention to put those in there is that right uh, if it is possible you know, everything that's difficult about this site makes some of the things we'd like to do sure. difficult to do, too, because there's just so little room in the front of the building. Okay. Um, in the packet, it also shows that your shuttle van is going to be parked in the, in the front. Um, will that have, like, the, the name of the facility on it and stuff like that? It would certainly have the name of the facility on it. It's parked not up front, but back towards the handicap spots, I believe. I can't see it. <laughs> Lower right hand corner. But it, it, okay, so it is up front. Yes, it would have the designation. It, uh, I thought it was on the right. Is, are there two signs? Um, you know what? I think it's actually shown. It's there, and it, I see it down there. Okay. okay. I'm sorry, uh, Commissioner Powers. It, it's okay. I'm just wondering. Um, I guess I'm not. I, I'm not. Um, I guess overly thrilled with it parked in there because we have problems with other people. You know, kind of, and I wouldn't say it's advertising, but. Um, is there any way that maybe that could be parked in the back, or is it typical that all, all the other locations you have, the stuff is put in the front? No, we uh, actually we started out trying to put it near the handicapped spots that are there in the front of the building. Okay. Just ran out of space. Okay, I'm just, I, I don't know, I'm, I guess I'll just, I'm just going to mention it. I'm, I'm not sure about it being located there, um, and that's, that's really all I wanted to say about that. Um, the lighting on the west side of the path, um, I think I mentioned about putting lighted bollards, but it looks to me like you put the 15-foot pole with the light. That, that's, that's your proposal, correct? That's correct. And I think that looks, I think that's fine because I looked at the photometric plan, it seems to light it up, so that's okay. So the purpose, I guess when I said bollards, are you, are you, is your proposal to put like two bollards in front of like the walk so like somebody doesn't like back into it or something like and yeah, go on the right path? Right now the intent was to put bollards where someone might confuse the present t I think it's about a 10 foot wide bike trail okay. as part of a road. Was it intended to light it? We've got some other lighting there but that was all. Okay so that that's fine. Okay I think it the other, the, the last thing I want to bring up right now and let somebody else ask some questions is um, normally since I've been on the commission for a little bit over a year, we've, any kind of enclosures we had have, have always been cedar. I don't know if I've ever seen a, a wood composite 
uh, fencing come uh, before us, but what I wanted to ask is that the wood composite fencing, is that like the, the plastic type fencing, the sturdy type plastic fencing? I'm not not really familiar with what a wood composite fence is. No, it's, is. it's not a vinyl fence. It okay. looks like an actual wood product, but it has plastic infused into it, so it lasts longer. It looks like wood. It's pre-finished, and it, it really looks like wood, and it lasts a long time. With a, with a cedar fence, there's maintenance and staining, and you're always going to have to take care of it. We've used this product at several of our projects and our, and our clients are really pleased with it. In fact, I'm doing another project. They asked me to use that product again because it looks very nice and it's very low maintenance. Okay, Andrew, do we have any, any facility, we, do we have any properties on, in the village that has that type of fence? We do. We've, I was just trying to think if we've had one since you've been on the commission. Um, the, uh, the one that I definitely remember was the Lexington uh, healthcare building on Hence Road. Oh. <laughs> Uh, they have a, a composite. I think theirs was the Trex brand, uh, darker brown. This one, it's pre pre colored, so uh, they, they can match it to. I can't remember how many, but thirty something different shades. Yeah, they have different colors, and it, it looks like a wood product. It's just it's the the maintenance on it. it. It looks it always looks good. Yours, you don't have to stain it, and uh, you don't see it fade. And that's fine. I have nothing further for right now. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Commissioner Steiler. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just a comment for staff that this is our second uh, development in the mixed-use transit development area that is not mixed-use nor transit-oriented. Uh, quite the uh, opposite. Uh, you're really not going to be much of a transit nature at all, right, uh, with the uh, reduced parking. Um, are, are the residents of the building going to have, you know, like the uh, emergency pendants or wristbands or some kind of emergency alert uh, on the inside of their unit in case at they fall down or something? At this point in the memory care unit, uh, it's a completely secure unit. So the answer is no there. Mm -hmm. I believe it would be an option, and it's usually something that's discussed with the family and uh, the resident, whether that we have the low voltage capability in the building to do the monitoring, but uh, they can choose any of a number of services, even the ones that call out. Um, so it's not a mandatory thing. Will, will you have staff on site 24 hours a day in, in case somebody does have uh, falls down in the shower or yes, whatever. Well, and that works uh, some other ways. Um, we have staff on site to uh, two, two of the busier shifts and then through the evening shifts, but we still have staff, including a nurse at all times. And there are call systems in each of their rooms and we are looking at, but haven't decided yet, if we use just a voice-activated call system in addition to the poll. Because then you can ask what the problem is. And it's a fairly new technique, but the material's being looked at now. But we've always had the poll-type call systems. And uh, there are regular checks made of the residents, especially as they go through the night. During the day, we try to keep our residents out of their rooms as much as possible and engaged in activities. The, uh, the second and third floor residents, are they required to enter and exit the building through the front door, or can they use the, uh, I'll call it the emergency exits, but let's just say the other exits that might lead outside? The only, the only place that they can't get through is at the rear of the building on the ground floor because that's all of that is the secure memory right. unit. But any of the other entrances, yes. So I mean if, if they saw their uh, son or daughter drive in the parking lot, they wouldn't have to trek down the hall to the elevator, they could just walk through. Sure, down and up. if they parked in the rear, they could come through those entrances. Okay. Um, are, are there emergency exits, though? And I don't want to call them emergency exits. Are there 
exit stairwells on the end of the building where the second and third floor resident residents could walk down and exit the building to back to my architect but yes yes uh, they're located they're located at either end of the wings um, you take the stair and you can exit directly out and, and we located that on the south side of the building again in case there was ever a flood here we're exiting out of the higher dry side okay and from from that they there are sidewalks there where they can yes exit that connects to a sidewalk the... that loops around the building on both sides okay thank you that's good um, that, and are, are those doors secured in any way I mean after hours are they open unlocked all all the time yeah, different than our different than our secure unit they're locked from interest from the into the building similar to what the limited service hotels have now okay uh, most people would come through the front entrance at that time and be admitted and, and are, are the front doors do you have staff on the front doors we have um, a reception we have reception and they're there 24 hours a day good um, the one of the things that I really liked on let's see I think it was page 56 the uh, uh, the rendering of the buildings was that in your color rendering the bricks had a different kind of shading based upon some of the articulation characteristics uh, and the shadows that it casts. I, I wonder is it possible to use in some of the articulated spaces maybe just a little bit different color brick to kind of um, help that shadow effect? I can I can add that and my architect doesn't even know that yet there have been some discussions in in-house with us that there may be areas of the front elevation where um, bringing the stone up further than just where the base is uh, could help and the expression used amongst my builder types is to make it pop a little bit more and I think that's where we're going to go but I believe that would require me to come back through an approval process but we're actually looking at that and and you know I don't know if there's if there's anything that you can do to kind of how, what what is the depth of the articulation three feet uh, uh, there's some that are three and some that are four okay. you know if if you could just come up with a different very slightly different shade of the brick to kind of highlight the articulation I don't know if you know what I mean if you look at your color rendering it, it's very obvious that yeah in my experience uh, the reason we do the bays in and out is it provides that shade and shadow and different textures uh, using a slightly different brick sometimes is really almost kind of a disaster it looks like you didn't match the brick quite there's a building I can think of here in Northbrook that's a senior center that's they used two different color bricks just slightly off and it just looks like it was remodeled and they couldn't get the right match and it just didn't work out very well okay so we're, we're relying on shade and shadows to give us that different you know texture you're the color. expert I'll, I'll go along with you um, the last thing is that I think the uh, shuttle should be uh, parked in the uh, rear it looks I, I think it would look a lot better we're trying to hide the cars and stuff in the front and if we hide your shuttle in the the back of the building I, I'd really prefer that but uh, other than that I think it's uh, a really nice looking building for for being a solid single structure I think you've gone a long way to make it look like it's a uh, bunch of different connected uh, buildings I just hope the, the articulation does pop like uh, it looks on your picture so thank you Commissioner Vito uh, yeah I'd like to echo what uh, Commissioner Stylin just said it's a it's a really sharp looking uh, unit and I, I like the way it looks my my concern is and it's not one that's gonna uh, 
preclude me from voting yes on it. It's just the, the lot division and the lease back or the easement, I guess you can call it. Um, my, my concern is one, would it be done if, if you didn't need to be under that fi uh, the five acre limit? And number two is, you know, everything's always nice in, in the planning phase, but uh, things can things can turn bad. And, and I don't know, um, you know, what what the easement entails, what the if there's going to be any restriction whatsoever to either side in the communal garden area and that type of thing. And I can just see a problem down the road. But, um, you know, Shiradash and the Whitley, you guys are big boys. You can work it out, and that's, that's going to be your fight, and I'm not going to stop you from doing it. I just, just a word of caution. I mean, good fences make good neighbors is, is a, uh, you know, a truism that's often thrown out there, but there, there is a, a certain concern well, I, I have. I where you were going with that. One thing that is perfectly clear, and that is that um, each of the owners of the property where these improvements would be located will take care of their own maintenance. And if there were an issue, uh, just we would be a neighbor just as anyone else would be, and the city would be looking at your standards for what these properties have to be maintained for. Um, at the same time, you know, we're putting the money into uh, having these improvements in place and have a big interest in this because it does offer a large open area, not just views, but hopefully some uh, activities. And if we have any luck at all, we'll have a number of their members you know, in our building and have a much tighter you know, relationship. Right, I understand that is the hope, and that's my hope too, and, and it does look beautiful back there. It's just, I just, just a word of caution, that's all. And I, and I, and I wish you guys both the, the best of luck, and I think it's a really sharp thing. So. That it? That's all I have. Okay, great, thank you. I have uh, a few questions. Um, <clears throat> the, when, when, you, when we were here workshopping this, you originally said that the east entrance was going to be a write-in only. But I see you've decided to brave the uh, traffic and make it a uh, make a left turn out from there. Possibly a BM. Yeah, it. I misspoke or I spoke out of turn. I hadn't really looked at the uh, turn lane that exists all the way across the property, and it appears that we're not going to have any trouble with IDOT in getting a full access. In and out of that, Nixon. Okay. okay. You, you mentioned at the height of um, the shift, you, you're going to have 26 employees, and um, I think you indicated first and second shift would be 26 employees. I would assume there's some type of overlap in in those. So it's at some point in time, are Not you going to have 52 in there? No. Um, they change very quickly. The only ones who have a little overlap are in the food and beverage side. Uh, some will stay and assist with feeding the next meal, but that's the only time, and that's three or four people. How do you do the, what do you do with the uh, nursing staff? I would assume, like, at a hospital, there's some turnover. You discuss patients and things like that. What happens with those? What, what is that? Overlap. Well, I think the key thing here is to understand that, uh, especially in that lockdown section, you know, that's a memory care, um, the people are in actually very good health uh, for the most part because if they have serious medical conditions, they can't continue to live with us. So um, all that happens is that there's a transition usually because of um, activities that are going on, somebody will step in and lead the next activity. They won't notice the other person has left. At meal times, there are a number of people who are assisted with eating, and that's where I said there can be some overlap for a while because we'll keep a few more people there to help with that. But the shifts are pretty clean coming and going. I mean, they may be five leaving and five coming as they 
you know, just get it in and out for 15 or 20 minutes. But that's about all. Okay. okay great. Thank you. Uh, speaking in the dining room, what what is the the percentage of your residents that eat in the dining room? Because they do have kitchens in in the assisted living area, correct? So yes. what is that? I'm just curious. What is that percentage of 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 residents that um, eat in the dining room? I would say the evening meal is. 90% people who don't, you know, just didn't care to eat, and we have provision for them to have room service. Oh, okay. Uh, there are other places that they can have snacks in the building, but generally it's pretty well spotted. This is a big activity sure. part of the day. Oh, yeah. Uh, lunch uh, is probably just as well attended, maybe not quite as much. Breakfast is hit and miss. A number of people don't eat breakfast uh, immediately. They would contend themselves with, um, you know, toast and coffee, and they'll have that capability in their room. And so how many seats do you have in that dining room? You know, do, you, do, you have a, do you have a senior special that starts at 4 o'clock and everybody <laughs> comes down at the same time? Uh, it's my experience that everybody shows up um, promptly. Yeah. And there has been a problem in my mind in past uh, properties like this where um, it always looks to me like, you know, an elementary school lining up for meals. People come early and they're sitting around, the doors are locked. What's planned here is to run it more like a restaurant. There will be a podium that receives people. They'll be placed in our lounge on the side and be called up in groups. And so when their table fills, most of the people will eat at the same table. When their table fills, they'll be brought in. And this is as much quality of life thing as it is, you know, um, efficiency. But we can time some of the meals. We can give a little more time at the beginning, at the end, what would normally be that window that you give for, for dining. Um, we have enough seats for every resident, you know, at those meals. We do not have extra seating for people who might assist with eating, but the folks who are in the uh, regular assisted living side don't generally have that problem. Um, and it is conceivable if they did have that problem, we might seat them with folks in memory care for some of that time. Um, but I haven't seen that need yet. And do you have, and that's excellent, that sounds great. I, I love that concept, it's, it's really good. But do, do you have enough spacing around that for walkers and wheelchairs? It's um, always an issue, they get lined up along walls. Um, I wish I could put them all away but we haven't found a way to do that. And as the population ages in place, there could be more. Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, what it really means is removing chairs from the seating arrangements and, you know, trying to make less of that chair. A lot of them don't need the chair in short distances and can leave it parked, right. then they can walk to their tables. Right. Okay, great. Thank you. Now back, back to the building. Um, we talked about we talked about snow plowing, and it, the the plan that you have is sounds good north and then east, but the the bike path on the west side. Uh, who currently, Andrew? Does the village currently? The village maintains it. I don't know that we actually remove the snow from it. So. Oh, we okay. actually remove the snow from it. You, really? I've just been informed. <laughs> you do do the. We we do do. You do re remove the snow. <laughs> so if they're going to put bollards there, is that going to be an issue? Uh, usually on our larger paths, we do use a uh, either a brush or right. a V plow. Um, if it is directly in front of that, it would be an issue. So you're going to have to work with staff on that if you we, we may have to go with a no motorized vehicle sign 
as opposed to a bollard. Okay, so if we can. That's what I would have expected. Okay, great. All right. Then, um, staying in that frame, the, the, um, the screening plants in front, they're 36 inches high. Is, I, well, they they will eventually be 36 inches. I think high. it says 36 at planting. Uh, oh, 36 at planting. Four to five feet, possibly, uh, at maturity. So when will they be? My question is, when will they be effective as screening? We're we're talking about the utility area with. The no, I'm sorry. In, in, uh, I'm sorry. The um, south side. On Dund Dundee Roadside, Sorry, you, have the, uh, you have the you have the screening plants. I think they're screening. Whew, that's there, fast. right? The shrub planting that's right. along. They'll be about three feet to start right. with. Uh, ultimately, they'll get up to about uh, four to five feet. This is a this is a hedge type planting. The species of, of shrubs, and so we're on the page here. Thank you. Uh, Andrew, it's, it's, it's between the sidewalk and the parked cars right. is where you're asking. So how, so effective are, how effective are they as screening when they're planted? They're, they're three feet tall when they first go in, uh, and they'll, they'll grow you know, conservatively a foot a year. Uh, their spacing uh, for each plant will be about three to three, three and a half feet apart. So from Steve to me. You know, I've got a three-foot three plant here, a three-foot plant there, and, and so on. Uh, this is a, a two different species. We didn't want it to be a monoculture across there. This is a, a, a lilac uh, called Miss Kim yeah. lilac and uh, catoniasters. Uh, so they'll, they'll be substantial once they're established. And, okay, you're get, almost getting to my answer. When will they be established? Because uh, probably... Um, it, it, by the time they're fully grown, where they're touching, touching, it's probably a second year. Okay, that's good because we've, I think, I think the village hall here, along the, uh, along where all of the village plants are, uh, village cars are parked. We we have screening there that's still not effective. And <laughs> sorry, but it's not. I and it. Uh, <laughs> I just don't want to make that mistake again because you are on Dundee Road and um, and. Two years is two years is reasonable. Well, in something that we haven't said before, we pride ourselves in our landscaping, and we consider it a significant part of our marketing, just as the building is. Although the building and landscaping and all of that doesn't really directly speak to the care we provide, we know that if it doesn't look right, we're going to be judged as providing less quality care. So it's always been an important issue. Sure. Yeah, well, I don't have any issues with the landscaping at all. The, the quantities and character is fine. Speaking of the landscaping, the east side, um, we talked about, is that going to be cleaned up at all in the original, um, like, you know, I, I'm we, assuming we that there's talk dead. About it. There's, there's a little bit of a... Uh, Yes and no answer, and I'll try and be very clear, but the idea of leaving it a little bit wild and mature uh, is, is the intent. Uh, but if we, if we have diseased trees, dead trees, leaning trees, uh, you know, branches that are going to be sticking out, then it gets some selective pruning, uh, some, some maintenance. The underbrush, uh, if I have invasive species in there, uh, to try and clear out some of that. So it really does look like you have a nice stand of trees, even oh. though they're there are old toughies like box elders and things like that to try and clean them up. Uh, oh, great, great. Yeah, I, that's what I was looking for. Just some of that cleaned up. Thank you. It, we talked about the bike rack, and uh, I think Andrew, I, I, I'm sorry, staff was looking at possibly putting it on the Dundee Road side. But you mentioned, and I just want clarification, that right now it's on, on, on the north side. Can people access the building through that side? 
through the north. It would have to go around the building. It would have to go around the building. Okay, so I misunderstood. Um, is there room on the Dundee site? And, and the reason why I'm asking is I, I would think that the bike rack is going to be more used by visitors than residents and also employees. I, you know, I assume you're going to be hiring and there could be local residents that want to ride their bike. And um, I guess if it was on the north side, especially for visitors, they wouldn't have to walk all the way around. But then again, we all need a little exercise. So that might not be bad. But is there room on the Dundee Road side to move that bike rack? Sure. <laughs> oh, that's easy enough. Okay, great. We just don't happen to agree that anybody's going to use the bike. Well, bike. you never know. The, the, uh, the two front yard areas that are flanking, um, and, and I'm looking up, but thank you, Andrew, but there's, there's front yard lawn areas. I would pave a, a bike rack is basically a two foot by a six foot uh, for each uh, individual bike. Um, and there, there's room uh, in these two little perhaps on the west side uh, terrace area in front of the handicap uh, parking spaces, either there, Andrew, or to the east of that on the north side of the handicaps. Uh, uh, there's, yep, perfect, right there. So I'm, I'm somewhat close to the door. I could ride up, park it, lock it, and walk in the front door. Okay. Oh, how about in front of that, uh, there's a, a big sidewalk right in front of the generator room or enclosure or whatever could you put the a bike rack uh, back in well that? i think that's contrary to what chair yeah, i was, was just asking. looking for it on the dundee side that's in the back i was looking for it on the front side there's room to, to move here we're not so tight but I, I think your objective was to try and get something where if people are riding back and forth right. and want to come in the front door you could park exactly. close to the that's door. what i was looking for and then my last question is about the building, the hardy board being used. What is the thickness of that? Uh, I've got a sample right here. This is the, the product. And um, this is typically the thickness we'd use since we're up high. It's, it's up on the third floor. If I was down low by the sidewalk, I'd consider going something a little bit thicker. But um, this product has held up well on, on third floor applications for us. Um, I'm going to talk to the uh, commission about that. I know in our last um, the last docket that came through, we asked for a thicker um, hardy board, but it was closer to the ground uh, in that in that usage. I could see up above, and again, hardy board like any well any other material. Depends upon how it's installed. If it's installed right. well, it's going to right. last a long time. So what I see with this product is, it, if it does get hit or impacted, it, it would like say at a lower level where somebody might hit it with moving in or a bicycle or something. You know, it could crack, but up up above, it really is not in that jeopardy. From a um, from a construction standpoint, what what would be behind the hardy board here? Is it the same CMU wall? So all of our walls are going to be uh, like a metal st metal stud, and then we're going to have um, a jip board for the fire rating, and then we're going to have continuous insulation that's required by the energy codes. And then there's going to be some attachment struts that those would go into because you can't attach right through the insulation. So it would be backed up with, with that. What do you think? I think, I think in this use that... I don't, I don't know any reason not to. We yeah, just not to just confirm. Right. Like, yeah. Okay. Uh, okay, I'm okay with that. Oh, and just one last question, um, Mr. Meacher. You, you, the name of it, the Whitley, all the rest of your um, buildings are called autumn leaves, but this one is the Whitley. Did you just want to rhyme it with wheeling or? It, it was desirable to uh, create a different brand similar to hotels in the, in the range of what they serve. Um, all of our autumn leaves are memory care only. Ah, okay. So. That's what I thought. 
Good. I like it. Great. Does anybody have any other questions? Commissioner Dorban. Let's we'll start with Commissioner oh, Dorban. Jerry, Jerry, go first. Jerry. Mr. Stanley. Uh, question about the, uh, what, what do your typical residents do during the daytime hours? You know, you have that nice area, sitting area out by Dundee Road. Would, would, would the residents go out there, sit and watch the trucks go by? Uh, I know in, in nursing homes, people like to go outside and just sit anywhere they can along the sidewalk, whatever. In the assisted living area that I've been at, I'm not sure that the people go out as much, but you... Well, let me describe to you what I've seen in the past year. It was my challenge to go out and look at everything I could find. And I've seen properties in six states and probably a thousand properties. A lot of them are older. And I didn't miss the comment about you know, people sitting out front, for example, in a number of properties. When we set up this building with the um, courtyards on each side, one of the, the sitting room and the other on the dining side, the hope was that they would feel comfortable sitting out there, not just in effect in the driveway at the front door. And um, to, but at, to answer your question, separate from the memory care folks who have uh, a constant number of things going on, I see that life in um, the regular assisted living where our residents are older now, they will not come stay with us until they have no ability to stay at home. I mean, that's just the way the world has now shifted. Uh, so we have a lot of care to provide as opposed to a lot of uh, active social things for people to do, which was the 15 to 20 year ago, it was a resort with some medical assistance. Because of that change, um, I've seen that life revolves around those three meals and what you're doing before and after those. And most providers have organized activities from exercise classes to reading groups to, you know, everybody does it slightly differently, but it's still to keep people engaged. And to bring them together, one of the objectives is to get people out of their unit so they're not isolated. One of the biggest benefits to this type of living arrangement is they aren't isolated. I mean, they might love their home, but it gets more and more isolated as their friends drop off. They can't drive. They can't get out to their churches. They can't go shopping. So it's to bring the people together inside the building. And not a lot of the activities, in our case, are going to be structured around bingo. It drives a lot of our people nuts. That's, <laughs> um, my own personal view from what I've seen is that older people, and I'm becoming one of them, um, don't feel any differently than when they did when they were younger. They want to be happy. They want to be engaged in things. They don't have some of the physical capabilities any longer, so we don't have to put golf in our brochures. But what I have seen is with this focus of the three meals a day, that we can have activities for them before Breakfast even for some. After breakfast, you know, it continues into coffee clutch and discussion groups and reading the papers and that kind of thing. And at lunch, you're usually coming in or out of the strongest activities. Those will be more uh, active activities. There's very little activity coming into the dinner time, and people are usually in their rooms. And I'm trying to get them to I'm a proponent for this, but I'm not the operational people. I want them to come out and be in, in a social situation, leading them into dinner. The same as sitting in, well, I hate to say it, but a bar waiting to be seated at dinner, where there's talk and there's things going on. 
I don't happen to believe, and my people have now come around to this, that, that a person, just because of their age, if they're accustomed to an adult beverage, shouldn't be able to have that. And so that has been approved in what we're doing. After dinner, I'm hoping that people will go back to that space that we've set aside for music and activities and just socializing, because usually it marks the end of their day. They go back to their room, and that's it. So all of this is trying to really respect the fact that there's still people in there. They may have some physical limitations. What it really means is we don't leave them to themselves to just go sit out in front of the building, you know, in a lawn chair. Um, if I can help it, it's going to be an activity. But I couldn't leave them no place to go outside because I know the interest in the outside world too. I mean, you know, you have in the back yard, you have what appears to be a very nice place for anybody that wanted to go out and walk around in the the grassy area or the uh, the cherry trees or what, whatever the the private gardens that uh, uh, your neighbor was going to have do you think they will be mobile enough to go out and and rummage around that that back 40 area or will they stay pretty much there under will be some that go and I was asked this by the Dutch folks um, they're not going to be as active as what you would picture in most gardening settings. Uh, when gardens are provided in this kind of a setting, they're usually raised beds, you know, out in a patio area, and the people come and tend to small things that they can handle easily. They're not going to be stooping over in the garden. But I think that they would visit, we're hoping that they're going to visit and get drawn into the community that is involved in that to the extent they can. I think they're going to be observing. They love to observe young people and what they're doing, and I know the synagogue has activities planned. You know, I think that you know, we'll be chiming in, but it'll be from the sidelines. And, and just one, one last comment. You, you mentioned uh, golf, right? Uh, uh, <laughs> I know that my parents really enjoyed, in their assisted living building, the uh, third floor had a, uh, the, the hallway once a week turned into a nine hole miniature golf course <laughs> that uh, they had team competitions in, so. Uh. I'd like to carry that idea back. I, you know, we underutilize a lot of our space. Our building, because the scale is not large, doesn't have a lot of spaces that you might see in a large um, regular assisted living building. But we didn't see anybody using the pool room. You might see them using a card room and we may end up with that. Um, what it basically was telling us is that it was a negative marketing thing to have all of these amenities that the people weren't going to use, but they know it was built into their rent. So it was pretty, but it wasn't useful. And we tried to keep it down to, you know, the things that you would have, not too much different than home, except you'd have people around you. That's it, Mr. Chairman. Thank Commissioner, you. Commissioner Dorman. Uh, one of the, I guess this is for the landscaper. Uh, one of the questions that staff had was, regarding the size of the caliper of trees and wondering if they could all be enlarged. I think your plans all show two and a half inches. Is it I, possible I did to hear, go up higher? Uh, I did hear Steve Meacher say that there was a staff comment that increases the two and a half to three inch. So. Okay. And I, do we have any idea when ground baking might begin? I, I just wondered when groundbreaking might begin. Um, it'll be a little awkward because of winter. We're going to hope to get through this process 
um, and get perhaps to a clearing and maybe foundation permit uh, that will allow us to do some work before hard winter sets in. The reason for that is the springs are wet and it's hard to come out of the ground. So at the same time though, we normally try to have some improvements in the ground and see some real growth. We don't go out on just a bare field and, and dig a hole generally, unless the lender makes us do it. <laughs> so I would say that it's a spring start, a real spring start, and 10 to 11 months of construction. Thank you. Commissioner Powers? A couple quick ones. <coughs> um, in the engineering report we got, it mentioned something about uh, the type of fence that's installed within the floodway limits. Is there another fence on the, on the north side of the parking lot? What, where is that fence on? Is, is that designated on the plan that we're looking at here? You can do it. Yeah, the, the two right. fences uh, that we're talking about are on the back side. They're in the two Sorry, gardens. Sorry, I was trying to get to the one that showed the line. <laughs> there you go. It's in the two gardens there oh, for the memory okay, okay. care. That's and fine. it's that black, it's the black kind of wrought iron. Okay, that's fine. Um, last question I had is, um, and this may be for staff, the last PUD we looked at, we um, got percentages of material that were on each elevation. I don't see that here. Will we be getting that? Is it like part of final PUD or no? No, I had not. Uh, I had not calculated out for this one because it is so near 100%. Uh, just visually, I had not uh, asked them to provide. Okay, it. that's fine. All right, I'm fine. I, no, no, for nothing further. Just one other question in, about the facility. Will the rooms have internet access, uh, Wi-Fi throughout the building? Yes. Uh, for assisted living, we absolutely must have that anyway. Mm -hmm. And it helps us to complete what we call our low voltage system anyway. Oh, okay. We have the capability of, of you know, uh, communication within the building amongst staff with the emergency systems, right. you know, the alarms and all of that. So it just gets worked into that. Because I, you know, some residents are, you know, that the age group granted is a bit older and, and new to the computer revolution, but they're using them. And, uh, you know, a lot well, of them have, have little tablets that, you know, they, they can do FaceTime and whatever with family and friends and, you know, it's just, we actually have space on the ground floor, common areas, to towards the back left of the building, which is designated as a library, but will also be uh, an internet capability. Like, a, like an internet, little internet cafe or something? Not quite a cafe, more right. uh, just a quiet area. space where right. you I think it's a, I think it's a great concept. Um, well, especially for video conferencing yeah. too. Right, well, I, I think your whole general property is a is a great concept and Thank you. Um, as the population ages as the baby boomers age it, it's something that's going to be needed and uh, I think it's a very good concept so Andrew we have a number of um, conditions now I guess the question is and the petitioner has asked that um, they go to final PUD with this? The, so, so where they are right now, the petitioner has asked for preliminary PUD. Uh, the concept uh, discussion, there was some, uh, there was a request for consideration if the plans are submitted as a final, uh, whether the, the commission would entertain uh, making a si simultaneous recommendation. The, the village board, of course, could say, uh, yes or no to that and just approve it as a preliminary PUD approval. But uh, as, as it's been submitted at this point, the, the plans are, uh, as I mentioned in the staff report, nearly consistent with what is uh, required of a final PUD submittal. Uh, so it would be uh, at the discretion of the commission uh, to work through the options here, which would be a recommendation um, for preliminary, a Recommendation for final, uh, asking the petitioner to come back uh, with revised plans for either either one of those options, either preliminary or final. So uh, I have a handful of conditions. 
Uh, but if, if you'd like to um, poll the commission on uh, how they'd like for the, the procedure to, to work from this point, sure. do that. Commissioner Stalin has a question. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that typically gets done between the preliminary and final, right, is that all the engineering work is done and you know, all the, the setbacks and all, all that stuff that might deal with the placement of the parking and placement of the buildings and stuff like that. Has that all been relatively done such that it could meet the uh, final criteria? Yes, m much more so than you would typically see at this stage. Um, due to the location of this line, uh, a lot of that had to be sorted out for the concept review, actually. So uh, the project engineer had to submit uh, detailed calculations of uh, the offsite compensatory storage, which is, um, uh, I, I believe we, we provided that with what you, what you received. So uh, this particular submittal is more, more advanced in terms of the engineering just due to the constraints on the site. Andrew, why don't you read the, uh, before I pull them, why don't you read what we have so far. Now, these conditions are uh, the staff draft uh, just pulled out from the discussion. Uh, if there are any um, questions about this, please stop me as we go. Uh, number one, uh, that the shuttle van is to be kept in the rear parking area. Number two, that the flagpole area plan must be provided for review prior to installation. Uh, number three, uh, there was some um, brief discussion about the, uh, the diagonal path easement. Uh, so what I had drafted, uh, just for discussion purposes here, uh, that the new path easement is to be modeled after the easement for the west path with the, uh, with the path to be installed during the construction of the building. Number four, that the path bollards are to be replaced with no motorized vehicle signage if required by the Public Works Department. Number five, that the eastern wooded area is to be cleaned up as needed to remove dead or potentially dangerous trees. Number six, that a single bike rack is added on the Dundee Road side of the building. Number seven, that the wall-mounted light shown on the presentation slides is submitted for inclusion with the lighting exhibits. And number eight, that the shade tree caliper is increased to match the code standard. So I'm going to pull the commission and ask them, based upon what we've heard here, um, can this be moved to final and vote as a final? Or do we want to vote it as a preliminary, have all of these uh, conditions um, added to the plans and they would come back for a final so I'll start with Commissioner Powers I can see doing a preliminary but I'd like to see it come back for final because I have not seen a detailed landscape or irrigation plan either and we did have that for the other one so without that I can't see voting on a final Commissioner Vito. Uh, I think it's been vetted. I can, I can vote on it as a final. Okay. Commissioner Dorband. I would have to agree with, uh, with um, Steve. Commissioner Stylin. Um, I, don't, I don't think there would be any hurt in uh, just letting them finalize the plan and, and uh, Pretty it up and come back and see us. It shouldn't take that long to go through uh, finalizing it. Okay. Uh, there's your answer. We'll vote for on the preliminary. Preliminary, and um, we'll, you'll have to come back for a final. The question um, that I would have for the commission then. Uh, if the staff draft of that third condition related to the language of the bike path easement on the northeast, is that, uh, does that reflect the desire of the commission? To me it does. You might want to read it again. 
Uh, the way that it reads, and again, we're referring to the, the diagonal path that cuts through the back here. Uh, the west path is existing, uh, and it has a um, public access easement over the private property. So the, the wording of the, con the uh, condition here is that the new path easement is to be modeled after the easement for the west path with the path to be installed during the construction of the building. That, that, that fits me, yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm okay with that. Is everybody, yeah? It may not be appropriate since you're going through your discussion, but I don't quite follow the diagonal path, okay? So the diagonal path here, uh, as of right now, we don't have an easement document related to it. Uh, this, uh, this path has a, a plat of easement associated with it, and with that plat of easement, there's a uh, grant of easement document which grants public access to that area, even though it's on private property, and then it hands the maintenance, the long-term maintenance of the path itself uh, over to the village. So that model of uh, the long-term maintenance of the path is, is, uh, could be used for this. We don't have a plat of easement for this, but the suggestion is that the same sort of model um, would be appropriate for the, this one. Is it appropriate to ask if there is a master plan for a path like this to be connected to other things? Um, you know, other parts of the village, is it carries it across town somewhere? There, there is a uh, active transportation plan for the village of Wheeling. Uh, this particular path has been on uh, the idea of having something along the creek, and it's probably, I would say, existed in some form or another since 2000. Uh, I don't know that the the remainder of that path, I don't know that the, room, the rest of it uh, was viewed to be somewhat impractical, but the connection along the creek itself has been yes. a part so of it. What you're calling for, though, is an easement at this point. Well, there is no, what you've submitted, you have shared access easements for the drives. Uh, there is no ac access easement, public access right. drafted at this point. Uh, the suggestion is to model it after the other one. Uh, there's no um, requirement to do that today, uh, but the direction would be to model it after the long-term maintenance. Um, when you finish with the other plat documents, you could certainly have that one drafted that spells out the exact uh, width of that easement area, and then along with it, we can hand you the boilerplate language for um, granting public access, uh, and then uh, handing the maintenance, the long-term maintenance of the path over to the village. Okay. Well, that involves several of us, so we're going to be talking about that. One other thing, since we're, since we're going to be coming back, <clears throat> Mr. Antor, in his um, in the fire in the report from the fire department, mentioned the um, maintenance building. Yep, we can bring all new material, all the materials needed for that. It was, as I've explained to other people. And afterthought, we have it on all of our other properties. It was left off because we didn't have room for it, and then it was right. added back in because we have to have something for this. Right. Part. So if that that detail is added since we're coming back, that would be great too. Okay. Right. Anything else or that you could think of from your? No, no, no. Yet, I think that they had a fairly complete package, yeah. and my comments reflected that. Right. And to Commissioner Powers. Uh, statement and Commissioner Dorban agreed about the landscape plan. I believe we're looking for quantities that are going to be, I, I don't think they're listed. You show the, unless I miss them, you show the types. Is that, is that more complete is what you're looking for? We actually have that done, uh, but it was too late to submit for the package. Okay, great. So then that'll be an easy add. So do we make a motion on the preliminary? Yes, you do. Okay. So do I hear a motion on the preliminary? And just do them separate? 
the yeah. all, you're talking about the, the PUD itself has a has a docket number, and then the, each of those preliminary plats. Has and so we have to. Each one of those has to be approved. We can tackle the PUD first, and then <laughs> yeah, let's tackle the <laughs> PUD first. I'll check with the village attorney yeah. on that one. Okay, so uh, Mr. Secretary, do I have a motion on um, 2014-15? 2014-15 special use site plan approval of preliminary planned unit development for assisted living facility with memory care? So moved. Second. Motion was made by Commissioner Vito, seconded by Commissioner Stylin, Mr. Secretary. Commissioner Vito. Uh, yes. Commissioner Stylin. Yes. Commissioner Dorband. Yes. Commissioner Johnson is abstaining. Commissioner Powers. Yes. Commissioner Zangara is absent. And Chairman Rafato. Yes. That's five yes, one abstention, and one absent. We call on the. Uh, we, have to, we do have to make four separate sure. motions. Sure. Okay. That's uh, fine. They run from let's see. PC 14, 17, 18, through 19, 20. 20. Yep, I got them right in front of me. Uh, do I have a motion on PC 14 17, approval of preliminary plat of subdivision for the Whitley? <coughs> so moved. Second. Motion made by Commissioner Powers, second by Commissioner Vito. Mr. Secretary? Commissioner Powers? Yes. Commissioner Vito? Yes. Commissioner Dorband? Yes. I abstain. Commissioner Stylin? Yes. And Chairman Rafato? Yes. Did you get, get the motion in a second? Okay, great. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to recommend approval of PC 14-18, approval of the preliminary plot of subdivision for Sir Haddish. Do I have a second? I'll second. second. Motion by Commissioner Stylin, second by Commissioner Powers. Mr. Secretary. Commissioner Stylin. Yes. Commissioner Powers. Yes. Commissioner Dorban. Yes. Commissioner Vito. Yes. Chairman Rafato. Yes. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to make a motion to approve PC 14-19, approval of preliminary plan of consolidation for the Whitley. Mayor, second. Second. Motion was made by Commissioner Powers, second by Commissioner Dorban. Mr. Secretary? Commissioner Powers? Yes. Commissioner Dorban? Yes. I abstain. Commissioner Stylin? Yes. Commissioner Vito? Yes. And Chairman Rafato? Yes. Do I have a motion on PC-14? Approval of preliminary plan of consolidation for Sher Hadash. 14-20. 14-20, sorry. No. So moved. No. 14-20, I hear. 2014 is the docket. Yeah. Second. <laughs> I, I'm sorry, who made that motion? I did. Uh, Commissioner Powers, Powers second by Commissioner, Commissioner Stylin. Stylin. <laughs> Commissioner Powers. Stylin. Powers and Stylin, yes. Commissioner Powers? Yes. Yes. Commissioner Stylin? <laughs> yes. Commissioner Dorband? Yes. I abstain. Commissioner Vito? Yes. And Chairman Rafato? Yes. Motion, do we have a motion to close? We need a motion to close the hearing. Yes. Motion to close? So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Can we take a five minute break? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>
2014-20 Sher Sher Hadash Synagogue, 200 West Dundee Road, concept review of a special use site plan amendment. Mr. Jennings. Thank you. Uh, most of what uh, would be discussed at this point has just been discussed in conjunction with the, uh, the plans for the Whitley. Uh, however, since uh, the representatives of Sher Hadash have so patiently stepped through that, uh, they'd like to just introduce <laughs> themselves and say hello. Okay, <laughs> sure. Thank you. Uh, my name is Steve Friedland, attorney with Applegate Thorne Thompson, represent uh, the synagogue. And everything really was, was discussed. In fact, <clears throat> the purpose of our concept review is that we need to get together our formal application to amend our special use to match the site plan that you just previously approved for us in the new consolidated Plata subdivision, which will give uh, Shir Hadash the landscaped area behind the Whitley. Um, and it will also acknowledge the 32, what, what our submittal will ask of you is to acknowledge the 32 parking spaces that are going to be on the Whitley property for which we'll have an easement. The purpose there being that we intend to utilize those spaces to allow for additional occupancy of the synagogue. Um, so uh, we'll be submitting our formal um, amendment to the, to the special use, but as, as Andrew said, you really sort of discussed all of this with their project. We're just the mirror image of it. And just procedurally from a timing standpoint, uh, that, can, that can pretty much come in. Uh, even if the subdivisions are uh, in the work still, um, we can have a, uh, a legal description on their special use match the proposed subdivision, say pending on it, uh, we can also go back and, and uh, update the legal description after the fact. So however the timing works out uh, between the two parties, uh, we can work uh, with the legislation end of it to, to make sure that everyone's uh, closings are, are time appropriate. It, exactly. And I think what we'll want to work with you on, on that timing is we obviously need to make sure that both approvals um, either Whatever the last approval is, is when we can close. So we'd like them to obviously try to try to occur simultaneously. So we'll try to get our application together so that we can come before you. We understand they're going to be coming back for a final um, approval, but all of that hopefully can come together so we can do the closing at the same time. Okay. Are there any questions? Uh, hey, there was a, um, sure. Powers. Can you just um, real quickly? Is it the intent? How does this how does this whole development get built out? Are they doing the assisted living facility first, and then the back part's going to get developed? I mean, is it the intent to do them both at the same time, or just do the building and sometime later follow up with the back half? Uh, the landscaping that's going to be on the Shir Hadash property. Mm -hmm. Landscaping on the Shir Hadash property will be built out by the Whitley. Um, right. My sense is it will be built out after the, I mean, after the build. When they would put in their landscaping, they'll put in our landscaping. Okay. Um, and the easement documents that we're negotiating with them provide that they're responsible for building out our landscaping, and then we're responsible for maintaining it. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Stalin. Yeah, I, I just have a, a little bit concern over the, uh, the shared parking. From uh, the Whitney's perspective, uh, you're granting them uh, access to, to your parking, which is fairly remote from them. On the other hand, the parking that they're sharing with you, the 32 spots are probably, I don't know, very close to your entrance if not closer than your normal parking lot. And I'm just wondering, are those 32 spots going to be, I'll just call it your primary parking spots, or are you going to just use that as, you know, auxiliary emergency uh, overflow-ish kind I, of parking? I, I think that's somewhat up in the air. Right now the entrance to Shir Hadash is to the, the, um, the north near that parking lot. I think there is some thought that it could move at some point so that the parking that, you know, the 32 parking spaces would be in a sense more, more of a primary um, parking lot. Um, so it, it could, it could be that way. Um, the, the discussions that we've had are we would view those 32 spaces and the parking that's existing at the rear to all be 
the same from our perspective. So it could be utilized um, uh, by us uh, just like our existing parking in the in the rear. Um, so yes, there's a potential that that could be. Uh, yeah, I, I guess that that's my only concern because you know. I understand what they're saying in terms of parking that uh, their, their patrons, probably their residents, won't be using cars. But on the other hand, I know from my parents, they didn't use their car either, but they had to have their car outside <laughs> the window where they can see it uh, just because they didn't want to give up that option of not having a car. They never used it, but it's they had to see it. And I worry about, uh, you know, they say they only need 68 parking spots. You probably wouldn't want them to park those cars that are never moved in the back of your parking lot that's shared as well, right? Uh, well, but it's not, and they, Based on the agreements that we're developing, they wouldn't have the right to do that. Okay. The shared nature of the parking between what they would be able to utilize on our existing property and what we would be able to utilize beyond the 32 parking spaces is for special events, you know, sort of a, on a very rare basis. So it's special events for them to use. And potentially even for us. So, so, so in other words, the concept would be that... Um, the Whitley would have the ability to park on the 32 spaces and our rear parking mm -hmm. on special events, let's call them. Right. And we would have the potential of parking on their 68 spaces, not the 32, their 68 spaces on special events. So uh, there was a funeral at the, at, at the synagogue, mm -hmm. or they have Mother's Day, mm -hmm. um, you know, so, something along 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 those lines. Um, but their rights to park. Uh, I'm sort of responding to your question about um, would you want them to have permanent parking of their cars on our existing parking lot? Uh, not only would we not want it, but that wouldn't be part of the rights that they would be given. Okay, so the way now the way I kind of hear what you're saying is that these 32 spots are more or less really yours as opposed to they happen to exist on their property but they're really part of your primary parking space that 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 yes that's that's the intention staff was that uh, your understanding as well yes the, the, they would have they would have the ability that the both parties have the ability to use them uh, the uh, Whitley application uh, notes their parking I think came out to 60 something what they projected their need was uh, they have the ability to add um, more parking on it they put some land bank parking uh, five or so five or six stalls and then this this parking uh, as well but uh, they they I believe their intention and you can correct me if I'm wrong on this, their intention was to um, meet their demand outside of the shared parking. Okay. That, that wasn't what I thought, but I understand now. Thank you. So w with the increased um, parking that you're going to get, um, I, what is your thought process there for additional activities? I mean, are you... I, I know you have your, uh, I, I, I think you have the high holidays at, are you still having them at Our Lady of the Brook? Yes. Yeah. And is that, going to con is that going to continue in, in the future, or is that maybe some of, it, some of it coming into the synagogue, which I'm sure you would like to have? Hi, I'll, I'm, my name's Glenn Graff. Do I need to give my address? Supposed to do that? Sure. Yeah, you can. That'd be uh, great. Glenn Graff, G L E N N, last name Graff, G R A F F. Address is 473 Thorndale Drive, Buffalo Grove. 
So uh, no, we, we will not be having uh, our full high highlight services because last, just the recent ones, we had about 700 people, so we would never fit Good. that many people in our building. Yeah. So uh, you know, we do we do plan to grow. Uh, uh, someday Rails will not be with share our tenant in the building. We're going to take over their part and build a larger sanctuary there. So our growth plans would be for a larger sanctuary, and we would need Good. more parking to support th that sanctuary. Good. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah, I have some. Yeah. Commissioner Vito. It would, my questions are on the same lines that I had for uh, the people from the Whitley. I mean, wh what is the nature of this easement um, for the garden area? I mean, has the language of that, the, the, the contractual language been drafted out? Uh, we, we, we do have a draft going back and forth. I mean, basically, um, it's just an open air. It would, it would allow residents of the Whitley and their guests to walk <laughs> onto our property. So, Unrestricted, temporally or in volume or. Yeah, I, I mean, yes. I don't think we see it as a, um, as any anything that would be untoward or or, or a problem. Um, the issues that I think where they would come up if it was unclear who's responsible for maintaining or who's responsible for for building it out, but those things have been have been agreed upon, so. And, and what about like, you know, there's this orchard and there's this garden and all that. I mean, is that for the Whitley's use as well? Or is that, I mean, not to sound silly, but I mean, if it's, you know, late September and a couple families are there, can they start pulling apples off the trees? You know, if my grandparents were there, they're all off the boat <laughs> Italians. They saw tomatoes. Those tomatoes are gone. I mean, I'm just, I'm just wondering what, what the nature of that, all that is. We haven't thought through the trees. We, to the extent we end up with uh, plots that turn into gardens, if Whitley people would like to have a garden and participate, that's fine. They've told us, as they've said, that they don't anticipate any of their tenants would actually want to get down on their hands and knees and garden. So it sounded unlikely that they would do that. But honestly, if they want to come pick some apples, that's okay with us. But and what I'm what I mean by all that is the the nature of the easement itself is is not all that specific. It's just a general open permission usage with no temporal restrictions or volume restrictions on the amount of people, anything like that? Um, that, that, that that's right. I mean, there's, there will be general language with respect to, um, well, I would say to the extent that they were providing some sort of nuisance or, you know, I, I, I don't think the grant would go to that. The grant allows them to cross our property. So, um, I mean, I guess we'll, we'll, we'll think that through a little bit, but I, I, we have not anticipated that there is really any incompatibility with allowing residents of the Whitley to walk onto our landscaping. Okay, thanks. One other question. Um, did you have a parking agreement with the school behind you? Um, I believe we do have an agreement right now, and so we have some overflow parking. Uh, so are you going to continue with that one also, with that agreement? Um, yeah, we may to the extent we need it, but um, we haven't, um, we've thought about whether we could come to the Planning Commission and get uh, permission to use that for our building growth, but we prefer to have our own parking that is sure. closer to the building and, and use that. Uh, to the extent that we actually overflow our 96 spots, Probably we would we would use that, but we're anticipating that to be pretty rare. Great. And especially with our rights to use uh, special event parking, we don't think it would happen very often. Great, thank you. Any other questions? No. Andrew, nothing else. No. no. Well, I think that's thank it. Until we see you thank next you. time. Thank you. Thank you. Look forward to it. Good evening. Thank you. Approval of minutes for August 21st, 2014. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Approval of minutes for September 11th, 2014. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. And September 18th, 2014, approval of minutes. So moved. Second. All, uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Great. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Jennings, other business? Uh, yeah, we have uh, one item from staff. Um, the, uh, 
the owner of the shopping center at Lexington Commons Plaza, uh, which is the location where the new Starbucks and the Salado were recently built, uh, had submitted a, um, a plan for landscaping to uh, the staff. The plan has um, three elements to it. Uh, one is the uh, sign area landscaping, which would be a new landscaping plan uh, that we are anticipating um, would be handled probably in the uh, first November meeting, uh, along with their sign uh, review. Uh, then they have maintenance of the landscape islands. Uh, they have a lot of dead trees that they're replacing. Uh, and then they have in the front, um, they had several ash trees that were uh, dead or dying and have been removed. Uh, I don't know if you've been out there recently, but they've been removed in the last month or so. Uh, they were, are able to salvage two uh, mature honey locusts in that front area, one directly in front and one sort of uh, if you go toward the kinder care. Uh, they are proposing replacing those trees with um, non-ash but similar trees um, and some of the tired uh, and dead uh, shrubs would be replaced at that same time. So. Uh, in conjunction with that, they'll be extending the landscape irrigation uh, from Starbucks east. Uh, they're going to bring it over to where the sign is. They said that they have the power, um, the volume of water, to get it all the way to the sign. Um, I, I'm not entirely sure that they won't need some sort of uh, pump or something in the middle, but I am not a landscape irrigation designer. Uh, so. All that to say, uh, you will see the sign landscaping for a formal review. Uh, the rest of the items we consider to be maintenance. Uh, they will get a permit, of course, for the landscape irrigation. Uh, but the, uh, you will see some activity um, probably in the coming weeks, um, most likely before you see the sign approval. But we just want to let you know what, what was there and, and make sure that if you had any questions, you could feel free to ask us. Um, other business. Commissioner Stein. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The only thing I'd like to say is uh, your tree cutter down people for the uh, ash trees are going crazy over in our area, and I've never seen them come in, cut down a tree, grind it up, and then get rid of the stump as fast as they do. I mean, in the matter, matter of uh, an hour they've almost done the entire block it's amazing how fast these guys go so they're really doing a good job you happen to see buffalo grove uh, on buffalo grove road they're cutting down ash trees there and the trunks are this big yeah and they've been there for at least now two weeks some of them have been there i mean they are huge trees and uh, uh, i'm just seeing areas where you know you're so used to driving down a path, and then all of a sudden it's open, and and you say, boy, they probably just cut down some trees, and you know you're just so used to seeing the, the you know the trees creating the arch, and then all of a sudden they're gone. It's just unfortunate, it really is. Commissioner Dorban. Well, heavily one thing, um, I happened to be talking with a police officer, and I happened to be talking about Brookvale in particular and but it would be good for any single family home or a, like a townhome development their recommendation was to put your address on the back door because as they're walking through backyards they have no way of telling what your address is mm -hmm. and I thought that made a lot of sense and I said I would bring it up here today for everybody to and the audience for to listen to it and just it's just a good idea it was a good was suggestion Okay. Commissioner Jensen. I have nothing. Commissioner. As, as has most of the night gone. Pardon? <laughs> as has most of the night been. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Commissioner Vito. Um, early voting has started, so make sure you get out and vote. There's no excuses. You can vote at Arlington Heights Village Hall or at the uh, Rolling Meadows Courthouse, 9 to 5, Monday through Friday. Uh, be informed, vote smart, vote early, but don't vote often. <laughs> oh, come on. come on. Commissioner Powers. Um, one, one quick question. Um, 
the last couple of PUDs we had, and I guess other items, we've had combined um, um, packet for like site plan and special use. Is there a reason why those are combined and, and not separated? Because I guess the thing is for me is I could see approving a special use, but maybe not quite like the um, the site plan. And so if if I don't like either or, I got to vote no. And if I say no to a special use, I have to give a reason. But it's it's normally, I, and I may not be able to take any one of those conditions related to you know, why I reject the site plan. So is there a reason why they're both the same and shouldn't, I don't know, I, I don't know if that, what that would be. That's just a comment I had. Yeah, the, the special use, um, just it's, it's the way it's defined in our code. Special use has site plan attached to it. Um, we have had, we probably had more consolidation uh, once the plan commission consolidated the uh, functions of the ZBA and the appearance commission. We probably had more items that are multi-purpose dockets. Um, we used to have uh, the site plan was separate from the appearance approval, which was separate from the variations. Um, so, you know, we probably have more things that are combined than, than there used to be, uh, but it's, the special use and site plan have been together for quite some time. I have nothing else. But Andrew, just on that same vernacular, I mean, sometimes we have uh, appearance and signs and a whole litany of things, but, but like tonight, the individual plot items got separated out. Could we vote separately on site plan and a separate vote on the special use to? I don't think you can the way our code is written. Um, and I'm not, I'm not sure that you can separate them. I, I would have to look into that. I don't know if, uh, if you know off the top of your head. I mean, that, that's an interesting point that, that, that Steve had, uh, you know. Yeah, the state, um, state uh, legislation that enabled us to, to, that gives the plan commission the authority to review those and the obligation to make the findings for the board um, might specify. Um, if it's just part of our code, maybe we can separate, uh, separate them. And I have nothing. Oh, you know, except I will not be here November 6th. So um, I assume they will be coming back on November 6th. I will not be here, so um, <clears throat> we have to make sure we have a full. We, uh, they would not be able to come back that fast. They have to go to the board first to come back. Oh, that's right. They have to go to the board. So uh, that's right. Okay. The, I forgot. I'm we sorry. do have hearings, though. Uh, right. Every every meeting, okay. probably the rest of the year, we have a public hearing. Okay. So, well, we'll have enough as long as they're not coming back. Okay. Great. Yeah. All right. Motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Aye.